Kevin, I'm going to show a banner that we will start at 9.10 so that live stream viewers can see that. Yep, thank you. Terry, you had a question? Terry O'Brien, you have a question? Terry, did you have a question? Hey, Victor, this is Sam. Um, you never sent us the phone number for, at the end of the day, the executive, uh, part of the meeting. It's been sent. Okay, you send it today? Yeah, I just sent it this morning. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm.
All right, everyone, I think we're ready to get started. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the June 18th, 2021 virtual meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Timmy Knutson and my pronouns are he, him, his, and I am the chairman of the ZBA. We have a great meeting ahead today. First off, I want to wish everyone on this call a happy Pride Month and a happy Juneteenth tomorrow. Yesterday, President Biden and Vice President Harris signed legislation to make Juneteenth a national holiday. In the past, often referred to as Freedom Day or Emancipation Day, Juneteenth is the celebration of the end of slavery of Black Americans in the United States. In order for our nation to progress, we need to acknowledge its full history. The federal recognition of Juneteenth is an essential step in that and realizing how much work is left to be done. I hope that everyone celebrates Juneteenth over the weekend. First, I'd like to take judicial notice of the fact that on May 28, 2021, the governor of the state of Illinois signed a disaster proclamation declaring all counties of the state of Illinois a disaster area due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. This disaster proclamation is in effect until June 28, 2021. Thus, Section 7E1 of the Open Meetings Act has been met. Second, I am making a determination pursuant to Section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of the board is not practical or prudent. Similarly, I'm also making a determination to Section 75 that because of the disaster declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Zoning Board of Appeals or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place in as much as there is no physical meeting place. Third, the meeting will operate under emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public board meetings and provisions for remote public participation, promulgated first by my predecessor and now by me, and which are posted to the board's website. I encourage everyone who frequently appears before the board to familiarize yourselves with these emergency rules, especially my recent March 22nd, 2021 updates, as we do not know how long the COVID-19 public health emergency will last. In line with these emergency rules, today's meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals is a virtual meeting that is being simulcast to the general public via live streaming. It is also being recorded. We've established these virtual hearings in keeping with the governor, the General Assembly, the mayor, and city council's goal to continue government functions while maintaining transparency and public safety. But there are technical limitations to this format that we must collectively manage particularly with respect to the presentation of new evidence during a hearing, the ability for applicants and objectors to resolve objections or amend proposals during the hearing, and the participation of large numbers of people. As a result, any material to be presented to the board, whether by applicants or members, <clears throat> or members of the public, was required to be submitted in advance of the meeting. And in addition, everyone wishing to testify at today's hearing, whether on behalf of an applicant or in opposition, was required to register before today's meeting. For those who do not regularly appear before the board, I will go over a few things. Number one, we are operating under the emergency rules. So for all applicants, objectors, and their attorneys, if you did not send us your exhibits by the cutoff date and time, you will not be able to reference them. Number two, all participants will be listed as attendees within the Zoom meeting until your matter is called. At that time, we will transfer you to a panelist. There will be a short switchover where you will lose the feed, so don't be surprised by that. Number three, once you are set as a panelist, please present your case. Board staff will be presenting the PowerPoint exhibits for everyone as we normally do, so you will not need to manage sharing your screen. Number four, please be mindful of background noise and please mute yourself when you are not speaking at all times. This includes right now. Number five, in addition, please note that we have a court reporter preparing our record. So it is important that two people do not speak at the same time. You might see me muting someone if that happens. Number six, if you are an active participant in this meeting, please do not watch the live stream. This will cause audio interference. Let me repeat that. If you are an active participant in this meeting, please do not watch the live stream in tandem. Number seven, please make sure you identify yourself while you are speaking. This goes for attorneys, applicants, members of the public, and board commissioners. Since all of us are remote, we and our court reporters cannot always see who is talking at any given time. I will also be administering oaths for each witness individually to accommodate for this. 
Number eight, if an applicant or anyone in opposition to the application has any technical issues presenting their case and is unable to proceed, we will attempt to continue the matter until the end of the call to create time to resolve these issues. If unsuccessful, we will continue the matter to a subsequent meeting. Number nine, after your matters are concluded, please leave the Zoom meeting. If you are interested in continuing to watch our meeting, which I hope you are, I encourage you to watch the live stream, which is accessible from the website. Next, fourth, I'd like to let everyone know, especially those that frequently appear bef before the board, a, a final reminder, and we won't go through it all, that we've made changes to the proposed fan findings of fact forms and cannabis community meeting affidavits. We've allowed a slight grace period with respect to the old forms, but that grace period has now expired. Now, the expectation and requirement is that everyone uses the new forms. I wanna take, take this opportunity to remind all attorneys and applicants that witness lists are like, any, are like any other document. They are due to the board by 5 p.m. on the Monday before the meeting. Let me repeat that. Witness lists are due to the board by 5 p.m. on the meeting or on the Monday before the meeting. Fifth and uh, somewhat different in the script, I hereby designate alternate member Ann McDonald to serve in place of regular member Jolene Saul for this meeting. Ann is a fabulous attorney at the law firm of Schiff Harden, an advocate and a proud Chicagoan. We're happy to have Ann on board and we give her the warmest welcome to the Zoning Board of Appeal. Okay, with that, I'd like to call this virtual meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals to order. I will take a roll call to establish quorum. Commissioners, after I call your name and you state that you are present, please verify that you can hear and see me, especially because of some technical difficulties that we've had today. First up, Commissioner McDonald. Present, I can hear and see you. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Commissioner Sanchez. Present, I can hear and see you. Commissioner Esposito. Present, I can hear and see you. Commissioner Toya. Present, and I can hear and see you. Great, and I am present, so quorum is established. The, meeting of or the minutes of last month's meeting have been distributed. Unless there are corrections, I move that we approve the minutes as distributed. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner McDonald. Approved. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I'm a yes, the, the minutes are approved. I move that we approve today's agenda. Um, Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes, agenda is approved. Now we're gonna take continuances and withdrawals. Um, per usual, we have a lot of them. Um, and I, uh, I'll i go through them and then we'll circle back. I'll go through my list to see if we can hammer them down that way. Um, so first on my list, if someone is here for what's actually our first matter of the day, which is 176-20-S. And if no one's here on this matter now, we can address it when it's up because I understand um, the complimentary application will still go on. So this is just approved or withdrawing the special use. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, can you hear me? Yes, Councilor, we can. Uh, good morning, my name is Agnes Plecka. I'm an attorney with Law Office of Mark Kubik and Associates. And uh, case number 176-20S, we were advised that that permit had issued, so we no longer need the extension. We will be proceeding on the other subsequent case, but case 176-20-S, we would like to withdraw. Great, thank you, Counselor. And we'll, uh, we'll see you in a few minutes here, because you're first up. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Okay, anyone here for calendar number 246-21-S? My understanding here is that Department of Planning and Development is requesting a continuance because of some issues with the plans. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, it's Nick Fatigas. Can you hear me? 
Yep, Councillor, I can. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Again, yes, I am the attorney on 24621S. It's my understanding that both the Department of Planning and uh, Alderman Thompson's office have requested a continuance for further review of the plan. Uh, we have no objection. It's the first time the case is up. We would just ask for a short continuance so we can move forward uh, at the next available hearing. Great. And we, uh, Nick, we can do that today. So let's um, move that to what would be July 16th, 2021. Um, our next meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. So calendar number 246-21-S will be moved to July 16th, 2021. Um, no further notice will be given on that, but we'll see you then. Thank you, sir. Yep. Okay. Um, next up, calendar number 247-21-S and 248-21-Z. Nick Fatikas again on behalf of the applicant. Um, I'm not aware of a continuance request. I know that the department had concerns um, and maybe issuing a uh, recommendation of denial, but we're ready to proceed. So I, unless there's another continuance request being made, um, it's not by the applicant. Okay. Um, anyone else on this call requesting a continuance? And that's fine. I just had um, a note that it's potentially being recommended for denial and that there was aldermanic opposition here. Okay, uh, Councillor, we'll see you on that matter. No, we're not gonna grant a continuance on 247-21-S or 248-21-C. So we'll cover that today. Appreciate it, thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, um, this is Nick Standiford. I'm an applicant's attorney for a 27521, 27621, and 27721. Uh, the yes. applicant is uh, requesting a continuance to the next available date. Okay, great. Um, that's perfect, Counselor. So yeah, that was all three of those. And let's uh, move that as well to July 16th, 2021. Thank you very much. And that's, so that's calendar numbers 275, 276, 277, a uh, couple variations in a special use, right? All special uses for different uh, cannabis related uses. Okay, special use trifecta, great. We'll hear yes, that sir. on uh, July 16th, 2021. Thank you so much. And, and counselor, I just wanna ask before we, we put it on that date, will you be ready? Yes, sir. Great. Perfect, again, on those matters, no further notice will be given. Um, so now is anyone here on 236? Yeah, I'm on a, a Zoom uh, zoning board. Can I call you back? 236-21-Z. Hello, I'm here for 21, 236, 21 Z. Yep, perfect, who's speaking? It's Leonard McGee, I'm the applicant. Great, um, and, and Mr. McGee, are you, uh, are you requesting continuance here? No, I'm not. Okay, one second. Ah, okay. My mistake. The one, the one that we're going to be discussing discussing is two thirty seven dash twenty one dash S. Um, I think Alderman Raboyas is here on this one. That is correct, uh, Chairman. I hope I didn't uh, uh, down downgrade your title there. Um, we we uh, we just want to meet with the applicant. There's there's no big deal on this, but I I just want to know what we're doing here and. Uh, we, we, we didn't receive notice, so, uh, and is that something that the ZBA does or? Yeah, we, we, um, we definitely send notice. So if there was an issue, it, it must have been with mail um, because it, everything on our calendar, I know notice went out for. Okay, just, I'm just requesting uh, the 
matter to be uh, deferred uh, until next month and I'll be more than happy to meet with the applicant on that. Okay, great. Um, is the applicant here on that one, 237-21-S? There would be a uh, uh, Leroy and Eliana. Uh, what's the last name? Silva. Silva. Leroy and Eliana Silva. The the uh, I don't know if they're property owners or. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. It doesn't sound like they're on. So, what we're going to do is if if staff can get in touch um, with with them to let them know it's being continued just so that they're not wasting it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, not, we'll notify them and talk to them. That's not a big Perfect. deal. Perfect. So we'll hear this one, 237-21-S, on July 16th, 2021, and no further notice will be given. Thank you, sir. Yep, have a good one. Thanks for coming, Alderman. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, I think next up, if anyone's here for 262-21-S and 263-21-Z. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Tom Moore on behalf of the applicant. Can you hear me? Yep, Counselor, I can, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a special use and a variance, uh, an addition to an existing, an older uh, building. And uh, at the last minute, the um, Planning department uh, said they were going to uh, give a denial unless we resolved an issue that was there before my people owned the building. Um, so we uh, are asking for some time to see if we can resolve. It's a parking issue and uh, see if we can um, look into that with CDOT and, and whoever will be necessary. So um, I don't think it's something that's easily or fast resolved. So I've asked for two months if we could please. Yep. And Tom, do you think you could use three or is two a realistic? Yeah, uh, we, uh, you know, I think it's going to take uh, some dealings with CDOT and uh, maybe a, a public way. It's, it's, it's an issue that's um, not easily resolved. So mm -hmm. um, three months probably would work best. Okay, let's do it then. So that brings us to, I got to look at my calendar quick. September. Um, it brings us through summer to September 17th, 2021. Okay. Um, so again, those were calendar numbers 262-21-S and 263-21-Z. And we will see you on that one in September. Um, and no further notice will be given. Thank you very much. Yep. See you in a bit. Um, okay, great. Next on the list, we have 274-21-S. This is Guaranteed Investments, Inc. Good morning. Uh, can, can you hear me? Morning, Counselor. Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm here on behalf of uh, Applicant L uh, Guaranteed Investments uh, for the special use permit on 7401 South State Street. Uh, we're here requesting a continuance. Um, as I understand it, we need to provide a fully dimensioned landscape plan, which will take a little bit of time. We're hoping for the uh, September to, uh, to continue us to uh, September. Okay, great. Um, that works for our purposes. So, and I will just note, I had a note in here um, that we need the community meeting exhibits provided um, oh, yeah. yes. as well. Um, so I know there's plenty of time to do that. We just can't hear it until there's the proper notice of the community meeting shown to us. So this matter 274-21-S will also go to September and that's on September 17th, 2021. And again, no further notice will be given. Okay. Great, thank you, Counselor. See you All right, thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, so we, we heard on 275 now, um, is anyone here on calendar number 149-21-S and 150-21-Z?
Uh, good morning, one more time. Agnes Pleika, uh, attorney with Law Office of Mark Kupik and Associates. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Councilor. Thank you. All right, so I'm here on behalf of Marine Drive Business Inc. Uh, two cases, 149-21S and 150-21Z. Uh, the applicant is still working and resolving some issues raised by the um, comments and reviews from the Department of Planning. So we would love to um, get a little bit more time to complete that. Uh, two months, I think, would be perfect for that. Okay, perfect. So you, do you think um, two months is sufficient? I had a note that September might be best, but if you think August, then we can go with August. Yeah, yeah, that would work. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So again, this is for calendar numbers 149-21-S and 150-21-Z. Um, we're going to continue these matters until August 20th, 2021, and no further notice will be given. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, is anyone here for calendar numbers 37-21-S and 38-21-S? Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Charlotte Huffman on behalf of applicant. Um, applicant continues to work with the staff of the Department of Planning as well as the Department of Public Health regarding some odor control issues. Mm -hmm. um, applicant did retain an HVAC consultant per staff's recommendation and we recently provided an affidavit from that consultant, which I believe is still under review by staff. So we're just asking for a short continuance to next month's meeting. Okay, and Councilor, you, I, this has been on the books for quite a while, longer than we, to be frank, typically allow. So do you think next month is realistic? Because if we're putting you on the books for next month, that gives my staff a bit of work. And I'm, it's up in the air that if we keep continuing, we may dismiss for want of prosecution. Sure, I understand. Um, I, I mean, to be safe, then I would ask for August. Okay. Okay, let's go to August. Um, and I'm hoping that I know everyone's working on this and it's not just stagnant. So I'm hoping things um, are figured out by then. So again, this is calendar number 37-21-S and 38-21-S. And this will go um, on August 20th, 2021. And no further notice will be given. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep, Councilor, thank you. Okay, is anyone here for calendar number 183-21-B? Uh, Alderman Perkins, I'm here. Hey, Alderman, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, good, thank you for joining us. Did you, were you gonna speak on 183? I, I was to, to show my support. I assume the attorneys would be on the call also. Yeah, so, and the attorney on this one, let me see. Is Lewis Powell on? I, I got a few minutes if you want to pass it. Okay. All right. And, and, and Alderman, just so you know, we have no issue on this one other than we don't have all the pieces of the application. Um, oh. For this type of application, we really need um, photographs of the block. Um, and we addressed this at the last time it was continued, the things we needed, and it just, the blanks still haven't been filled in. So in no way do we want to delay this. We just need the information. Oh, no problem. No worries. Then uh, do I need to stick around? And you address that with the, uh, with the applicant and their attorney? Yeah, so we're gonna we'll address it with the applicant and attorney. I'll when we get through continuances, I'm gonna give a one more call out to see if. Um, it, oh, Kareem actually has his hand raised, um, and I know Kareem is he's not the attorney, but he's on this. So can we get Kareem pro promoted? Kareem Musa Weir. Hello. 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 Hi. Oh, hey there, we hear you. Is this Lewis Powell? That is Lewis Powell. Great. Lewis, can you hear us? Hello. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear us? This is Attorney Powell. We were having technical difficulties. I'm here. Okay. And, and Attorney, can you hear can you hear me speaking? Let's give it. Let's give them a minute um, to to make sure they can hear us. Hello, counselor. Can you hear us now? Uh, yes, I can hear you. This is oh. Lewis Powell. Great. Okay, perfect. Um, so the alderman is on and we're just discussing 183-21-Z. Um, I know the alderman is support. One thing we requested that I, I just don't think we have received, it's not in my files, is we need um, photographs of the block. That's kind of the most essential thing for a PPA. Um, so I just want to hear your response on that because I know we talked about it last time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is Lewis Powell. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I think you, I, I take it you can't hear me. Okay. Mr. Lewis Powell, I'm going to stop your video because that might help if you can hear you then. Can you hear us now, Mr. Powell? This is Attorney Powell. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, let me know if at any point you can't hear me. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Cool. Okay, great. Um, so, Counselor, we were just discussing 183-21-Z. Um, Alderman Brookins is here in support. Um, last time we continued this, we noted how essential the, um, the photographs of the block would be since it's a PPA and the surrounding community is very important on these, we haven't received these photographs. So I just want to get your response on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, pictures have been submitted. Of the, of the surrounding blocks? Yes. Uh, all four blocks. All four blocks. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, because for some reason they just didn't come through to me, um, I want to make sure we have them. I'm not going to, I'm going to keep you on. Um, and, uh, we'll sort out to confirm that we have these photos. Very good. All right, Mr. Mr. All right, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I do have other unfortunate uh, zoom meetings at the same time. So I'm going to log off, but please know for the record, my uh, continued support for this project. Great. Thank you, Alderman for coming and we'll note the support. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Alden. Thank you. And for the record, I was on, but I just couldn't communicate with you. Yeah, no, no worries, Counselor. We heard you. I think you just couldn't hear us, um, but we're all good. So um, we're going to keep this on. Um, so next up on this uh, pretty long list of continuances is 221-21-S and 222-21-B. Morning, Mr. Chairman. This is Tim Barton for the applicant. Hi, Counselor. Um, we can hear you. Um, the applicant, uh, 3239 Division LLC, wishes to withdraw these two cases. Okay. Okay. Um, we will grant this withdrawal. I know there's been a lot of talk in the background of it. On, on it. So um, again, for the record, those are calendar numbers 221-21-S and 222-21-Z are being withdrawn by the applicant. And thank you, Counselor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, anyone else here to request a continuance or withdrawal or anyone that I missed?
sounds like none. Um, let's get started on the call. So first up on the call is calendar number 176-20-S and 177-20-S, one of which um, again was, was withdrawn. So it's really just 177-20-S. Councillor Pleka, let us know when you're ready. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, good morning, once again. For the record, my name is Agnes Black. I'm an attorney with Law Office of Mark Kubik and Associates, located at 77 West Washington, Chicago. And hopefully I should have on the call uh, Roman Popovich, managing member of the applicant LLC. Yes, I'm here. Um, and uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, um, that case was approved by this board on June 5th, 2020, which was in the middle of the pandemic back then. So everything uh, took a little bit more time. We had two cases. Uh, one of them uh, thankfully got permit recently. However, on the other one, we submitted the permit. Uh, the permit is being diligently uh, processed. Uh, recently, we received some zoning corrections from the zoning department and uh, they are also requesting that we provide, that the applicant provides uh, early uh, ordinance, early access ordinance. So the applicant is working with Alderman Vasquez to process and introduce such ordinance. So uh, we are hoping for fairly quick resolution and fairly quick permit. However, uh, we do request respectfully uh, extension on this special use. And uh, again, I have the applicant with me if there are any questions. Perfect. Um... Yeah, let's just get the applicant um, quick sworn So, Of course. Mr. Popovich, can you please state your name and address for the record? Roman Popovich, uh, 2608 West Huron Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60612. Great. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Okay, perfect. And Roman, are you the managing member of 5828 and Lincoln LLC? Yes, I am. And uh, uh, that entity was the applicant in the case for special use approved on June 5th, 2020? Correct. And since then you have filed application for permit and that application is diligently uh, processed? I have. And you are working currently with Alderman Vasquez's office to introduce early access ordinance? I am. Uh, but uh, we are still requesting respectfully uh, for the zoning board to grant us this extension for the special use, correct? Correct. Okay, yeah, that's that's all that I have of the applicants to chairman, unless uh, any of the commissioners have any questions. Any questions from the board? And, and Councilor, just to um, remind, this is a 12 month extension, right? That's correct, yes. Okay. Sounds like no questions from the board. Um, so we'll take this under consideration and, and thank you for your time today. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Okay, um, on a regular call, outside of extensions, we're gonna go to calendar number 233-21-S and this is 1546 West Howard Street. So Mr. Rivera, when you're present, let us know. And actually meantime, um, we will have Jeanette Velazquez from the Department of Planning and Development read the department's recommendation on this matter. So Jeanette, if you're on, I'll, I'll get you sworn in. Yes, I'm here. Great, thank you very much. Will you please state your name and address? My name is Jeanette Velasquez, and I'm a project coordinator for the Zoning Board of Appeals at City Hall. Thank you. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Wonderful. Okay. Um, please read the department's recommendation. Of course. Um, so the recommendation for 1546 West Howard, um, the recommendation states that the Department of Planning and Development recommends approval of the proposed hair salon. The department finds that this proposal complies with all the applicable standards of the zoning ordinance, 
is in the interest of the public convenience and will not have a significant adverse impact on the general welfare of the neighborhood. The department also finds the hair salon will be compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of building scale and design and operating characteristics. And lastly, the proposed hair salon is designed to promote pedestrian safety and comfort. Good morning, Commissioner. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jeanette. And is this Mr. Rivera? Yes, it is. Good morning, sir. Morning. Um, let me get you sworn in and anyone else you're with that will be speaking. We'll get them sworn in. Um, so can you state your name and address? Yes, my name is Juan Rivera, uh, 1546 West Howard in Chicago, Illinois. And you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceeding? Yes, sir. Um, anyone else with you that will be testifying in any way? Yes, I have Elizabeth Nakwe. Okay. And as well as Jalissa Burkos. Perfect. Let's just get them sworn in just so they, they can talk if they please. So Ms. Nakwe, will you please state your name and address? My name is Elizabeth Nakwe. I live at 1600 West North Shore, Chicago, Illinois, 60626. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Burgos, uh, will you please state your name and address? Jalissa Burgos, 4549 North Central Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60630. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Great. Um, perfect. Uh, so, Mr. Rivera, will you just tell us a bit about what you're doing? Yes, I am uh, opening a barber school for high school students in the community. I, I feel that this is a good uh, development in this community. Uh, a lot of individuals are interested in the hair industry. So we want to give them something to look forward to in the community and bring some, you know, some good environment into the community. That's great. So it'll be a combination of a school and a, and a salon? Uh, no, this is a barber school. A salon is completely different. Okay. We are teaching them the professionalism of uh, barbering, which is just cutting hair with shears and clippers. Okay. And, and will you give us a bit of a background on your experience in the field? Sure. Uh, of course, I would have to go further back. Uh, sure. I was good. wrongly convicted of a crime that I did not commit in 1992. Okay. While serving time in prison, I entered the barber industry and I saw the benefits that this would gain for the youth to show that, you know, the barber industry is not just a form of a culture to cut hair, but it also gives you a guideline of professionalism, business aspects, economics, uh, savings, you know, and working with the community. So while serving time, I experienced the connection that, you know, this industry brings. Uh, in 2016, I opened my first location in Glenwood, Illinois, in the south side of Chicago. Uh, I had a 6,000 square feet unit. It was very successful, but of course, COVID uh, took our funding. Uh, of course, this is a relocation to where I first started uh, living my life, which is here in the Rogers Park area. I felt that it was a need that I needed to bring here based upon my experiences in life and what I could bring for the future. So as a group, we all decided to give it a try, come here. And so far, the community, the older men, the, everybody has been very uh, supportive. And right now, uh, we're ready to go. We have about 62 students uh, ready to enroll. And we just want to give them something to look forward in the future. Yeah, that's, that's great, uh, Mr. Rivera. Uh, and, and just like some procedural questions. In your field, in, um, I'm a little bit naive to like the licensing requirements. Do you need any special license to teach? Uh, yes, we will have to have a licensed instructor in that field in order to teach the students the fundamentals of barbering so that they can have the uh, knowledge equipped to go take the board and actually become a licensed barber. Okay, okay, and you'll have all those licenses in place? Yes, we have uh, licenses of our uh, director, our teacher, you know, he's licensed in barbering and cosmetology. Great, perfect. Um, any questions from the board for Mr. Rivera or um, I don't want to skip over the two other witnesses if they want to speak as well. They don't want to speak. They, they, they don't want to speak. <laughs> Any questions from the board? Mr. Rivera, this is Ms. McDonald. I appreciate your story and 
the business you're bringing today. I just wanted to clarify for the record, um, you said that you won't be seeing customers and it won't be a salon, um, but I see the booths there. If you could just explain to me, you know, whether you will be seeing any clients and actually cutting hair um, or charging for those services. Yes, uh, again, it is a school and they still need to learn how to use the clippers. So we do have chairs because they have to learn the fundamentals of owning a school or owning a barber shop or a salon. So we uh, accommodate them in the fact as this is your station. You will have customers. Again, they need to have hands-on customers, not just mannequins. So we do charge a fee, which is a student fee. We don't charge like a regular barber shop or a beauty salon. We charge $8 haircuts. And that's just for the maintenance of, you know, the equipment and all that stuff. So we do have booth and we do perform services, but they're not professional services. They are haircuts performed by students. So uh, again, they really don't know the technique. They're learning. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Okay, Mr. Rivera, we'll take it under consideration and, um, and good luck on everything. Thank you, sir, I appreciate it. Yep, enjoy the weekend. Thank you, yeah, I do too. <laughs> okay, next up, we're gonna go to calendar number 234-21-Z. And this is at 2621 South Homan. Hello, can you hear us? Yes. Is this Miss De La Vega? Yes, this is Amy Garcia de la Vega. I'm the daughter of Richard Garza Garcia de la Vega. I'm just here um, to support with interpreting, and my father is present as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, great. I'll get you both sworn in, and um, I'm going to swear you in as um, as a translator. Maybe. Um, let me make sure I'm covering everything just real quick. So first off, will you state your name and address for the record? Yes, my name is Amy Garcia de la Vega. My address is 2621 South Holman Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60623. And will you be translating from Spanish? Yes, my father can speak English, but there are times he might need assistance and then I would help from Spanish. Perfect, then maybe, um, I'll, I'll swear you in, but maybe if you want to start with um, your father and you can fill in any gaps. Um, but do you swear or affirm to accurately, accurately translate from Spanish to English and English to Spanish in as much as it's required? Yes. Perfect. Okay. And uh, Mr. De La Vega, will you please state your name and address? Um, yes. My name is Richard Garcia De La Vega. My address is 2621 South Homan. Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60623. Thank you, sir. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's presence? I do. Perfect. Yes, okay, um, so tell us a little bit about what brings you here today. Yes, it's about the uh, carport that we built and uh, fans. Uh, I think the most problem is the fence that is uh, six feet high. And the reason we did it is because of uh, safety. You know, we used to have a uh, five foot and uh, they claim real easy. And uh, we have uh, taken some things from the yard. Uh, so everybody has their friends, you know, high in this area because of the, you know, homeless, they go in the, right in the area and they drink on the alleys and it's kind of dangerous over here. Yep. And will, um, how tall will the fence be um, in the part that is not see-through? So like the solid part? The part of the madera packet. No, it's six feet. That, six part, feet. that part six feet and then the excess. Yeah, um, the, the rail with the, uh -huh, it's uh, seven feet. Okay, great. And, and, um, that's thank you, uh, Mr. De La, Mr. De La Garza, because it for everyone on the board's um, uh, observance, 
our guidelines are six feet of solid and we can go above non-opaque um, unless we're granting some special special things. So um, thank you, Mr. De La Vega. And no I would also note that there's a lot of letters in support from your neighbors. So did you talk to the neighbors? Yes, sir, we did. Perfect. Okay, any questions from the board? Okay, that was a lot of silence. So I'm not hearing any questions. Uh, Mr. De La Vega, Ms. De La Vega, thank you very much for coming in and we'll take this under consideration. Thank you very much, sir. Yep, enjoy the weekend. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry, how do we know like what the next step is? Sure, it's a good question. We don't really explain it to anyone. Um, and so at the end of call, which sometimes happens pretty late at night, we come back and we read um, the votes. So you'll know if you um, get approved at that point in time, um, it'll be published on our website. Um, and then from there, if you have any questions, reach out to our staff and that contact information is on our uh, website. Just Google Chicago ZBA. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so next up is calendar number 235, S21-S. And on this one, um, while the applicant is getting settled, um, Jeanette Velasquez from the Department of Planning and Development will read the recommendation. Right. Uh, once again, my name is Jeanette Velasquez. Um, the recommendation for 1716 West Lawrence is uh, the department recommends approval of the proposed nail salon. The department finds that this proposal complies with all the applicable standards of the zoning ordinance, is in the interest of the public convenience, and will not have a significant adverse impact on the general welfare of the neighborhood. The department also finds the nail salon would be compatible with the character of the surrounding area, and is also designed to promote pedestrian safety and comfort. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay, um, sorry ahead if I mispronounced your name, but is uh, Lian Hoon here? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Yes. This is Lian Hoon. Yes, welcome. Um, Thank you. Great. Can you please state your name and address? My name is Lian Hoon, Kan Hung LLC. DBA Ravens Wood Nail Party, um, 1716 West Lawrence Avenue, uh, Chicago, Illinois, 60640. Great, and do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, sir. Okay, um, so tell us a little bit about your background and what brings you here today. Um, I opened the nail salon uh, back in May 2018, was an assisting nail salon. I took over that uh, space, this space and opened nail salon since then. I did not know that we have to do this, um, apply for a special U uh, when we change entity's name. So when I apply for a loan during COVID, uh, can you still hear us? Uh, agency request this one. I can still hear you. So. Okay, great. Great. We, we, we lost you for a few seconds. So if you could go back just a little bit, that would be helpful for our court reporter. Sure. Absolutely, sir. Uh, so I opened the, uh, the nail salon since two, uh, May 2008, 2018. Um, I took over the previous nail salon, which is they already had a uh, special use for nail salon. Um, operations. Um, I did not know that I have to do that when I change um, entity's name. So uh, when I apply for the loan, the one of the community loan uh, agency um, back during COVID time and uh, pandemic, and they asked for this paper and I started to look into this and then start to apply for the application for the special use um, for this uh, nail salon. Okay, great. So, Can you hear um, me, sir? 
Yeah, no, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Perfect. So, um, so you've been operating. Any issues while you've been operating, or has everything been going okay? Everything's going on, going okay. No issue. Great. And and you've been even prior to this, you've been um, in the industry um, for a while. Yes, it's been um, almost twenty years. Okay, amazing. Um, and I know, so your hours, it looks like, go to 8 p.m. Is that a limit? Uh, yes, that's correct, sir. Okay. And I also um, thank you for including, I want to note just for everyone that there's support from the Ravenswood Chamber of Commerce here. Yes. I, uh, I reach out to them for help because I, um, I am a member of them and they know us very well here. Um, so I asked um, to see what can we do because... Um, it's already had the uh, special use from previous owner and they sent me the whole application, the whole uh, package. Um, and then after that, uh, Ottoman, they refer us to the Ottoman and Ottoman office uh, and the uh, call the CD and CD guide them to um, back to me that I need to reapply for that. And that's what I did. That's perfect. Yeah. Good, good use of them. Make the chamber, you know, you're a member, make them work for you. Um, Okay, any other questions from the board? Okay, it sounds like none. Um, so we'll take this under consideration and thank you for your time today. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Mm, bye -bye. Okay. Um, next up on the call, calendar number 236-21-Z. And this is at So Leonard McGee, when you're available, let us know. I'm ready. Perfect. Give me one second. Is Mr. McGee, you are the applicant, correct? Yes. Great. And, and then will you please state your name and address for the record? My name is Leonard McGee, and my address is 8956 South Bishop Street, Chicago, Illinois, 606. Two zero. Great. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceeding? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about what brings you here today, um, uh, that would be helpful. Oh, I'm requesting a variance so I can get a PPA license. I'm, my business is located within 125 feet of a residential location. I'm actually on 63rd Street and the residents are on 62nd place. Perfect. And so tell us a little bit about what you're hoping to do with the space. I want to open a banquet hall to use it for funeral repasses, to create passive income and to get a uh, customer base for a brokerage firm that I intend to open. Okay. What type of events do you, um, do you foresee? Uh, for the most part, it will be funeral repasses, but I want to be able to hold weddings, birthday parties, and private, other private events as well. And because I am so close to the police station and I will have more likely a predominantly black clientele, I want to be as compliant as possible from the start. Great. Um, and it, I, I know in the, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the location? It was used in a way for events when it, it used to be a pizzeria, right? Correct. And once the pizzeria closed, the owner used it as basically for personal storage and he rented out the kitchen. 
Okay, I see. It's a complete um, commercial kitchen. Yep. And it was rented out for years. Okay. Um, and, and in this process, um, did you talk to any neighbors in the surrounding community about your plans? Uh, just the immediate neighbors and the owner of the two properties adjacent. And they didn't have any problem with me. And everyone who has called has been either supportive or dismissive. It was just that the, they were either supportive or I had no effect on their um, operations. And because I'm a block over, in any of the residents that called me, they were asking me why were they receiving this information when I'm on a other, another street. And I had to inform them that my back door is within 125 feet of their property. Okay, yep. Okay, great. And I, I might have a couple more questions, but I want to go to the board and see what's on their minds. Sure, this is Commissioner Sanchez. Um, is alcohol going to be served on the premises? Uh, not in the near future, but at some point I hope to get my liquor license in order to do so. And uh, what, what kind of hours uh, are you planning on maintaining? In the near term, I should be closing down by 11 p.m. How about in the far term? I am not sure because I hope to actually rent the space and possibly 2 a.m. When you're renting the space, um, for, for what kind of purposes are you, are you going to be renting the space? Weddings, birthday parties, private events. Uh, okay. And when you rent, um, are you uh, planning on having people uh, bring alcohol to the premises? Until I get my liquor license, yes. And when you when you bring alcohol to the premises, uh, or have or have renters bring alcohol to the premises, how are you intending to to handle that? Are you going to have someone on site to? Uh, oversee yes, that. I expect to have complete security. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, security if necessary. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I have a question. This is uh, Commissioner Toya. When you say you'll have security, is are you bringing the security, or are you going to have the people renting out the facility? Uh, higher security, how is that going to work? Is that going to be part of the contract that you give your customers that they have to have security? Or are you, or is it going to be part of the contract that you give your customers that security is in, in the proposal? It will be in the proposal. I don't foresee needing security for my basic use. And I don't foresee renting it out until after I get my liquor license and that may take anywhere from a year to two years. All right, but 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 if they're gonna be a BYOB um, and you know, so what no, time are you no, renting out no, the no, facility? No. To midnight, to one? You know. This on, is sir. just really to cover all my bases, but for the most part, I will be renting well, doing repasses from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay. That's, that's my bread and butter. But I want to okay. be in compliance if I go further than that. Or I just want to have all my bases covered from the beginning. I don't want to piecemeal it in going forward. I want to be ready from day one to do whatever I foresee is plausible. It's possible for me to have weddings, a drink at weddings, a drink at birthday parties. I want to be covered for any and every possible situation from day one. Right. That's why we're bringing up the security issue. Correct. 
So are you saying yeah, I, if there's I, I, alcohol I involved, trust, you'll have security? Yes, I don't. I wouldn't trust. Sorry, them. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I will let you finish. I was saying if there's alcohol involved, if they're bringing their own alcohol, will you then make sure that security is there? That's the question I'm trying to uh, get answered. Yes, if they wish to bring alcohol, I will provide security because I do not trust them to provide their own security. I would want to have someone that I great. Did it. So, if if we put this in uh, to uh, if we grant this and if we put it into uh, you know granting you the PPA, uh, would you be okay with that? So, anytime alcohol was brought to the facility, you would have security. Would you be okay with us putting that in? If we grant this PPA, yes. Okay. Thank you. That's that's good to know. Chairman, did you note that? Yep, it's noted. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions from the board? Okay, Mr. McGee, we'll take this under consideration and thanks for coming in today and answering all of our questions. Thank you, Chairman. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, next up, we're gonna go to calendar number 238-21-Z. So Ms. Abby Monroe, let us know when you're present. And I'll note ahead on this that this um, this matter has an objector that I think I see on that um, they're here. So Trista Trista Gunderman um, will be objecting, and just a little rundown on how we do these when there's an objector is we'll have the applicant um, put on their their case in chief. Chief, the board will ask any questions to get to the nuts and bolts of what the applicant is hoping to do. Um, then we'll go to the objector and the objector will state their objection. Um, the board might have questions for the objector as well, but the, or the objector has the opportunity to ask questions of the applicant. Then we'll circle back to the applicant for a closing um, and move on from there. So Ms. Monroe, um, I see you. Can, you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Perfect. Um, will you please state your my name? My husband is. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, Sorry. I was going to say my husband Josh Deal is also um, a co-applicant, and he's available as well if he want to turn his video on. Okay, cool. Um, we'll swear him in as well then. Uh, okay. So if you could just state your name and address, please. Sure, it's Abby Monroe at 1915 North Kedzie Avenue, number two in Chicago, Illinois, six zero six four seven. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Perfect. Um, and you said uh, your husband's, was it Mr. Deal? Yes. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Will you state your name and address as well? Yeah, Josh Deal, uh, same address, 1915 North Kedzie, apartment two, Chicago, Illinois, 60647. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Great, thank you very much. Okay, um, Ms. Monroe, can you give us uh, just kind of an overview on what brings you here today, um, your background and anything that you might be helpful for us outside of the application? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my husband and I purchased this property in April of 2020. We are the third owners of this very unusual Dual building um, in Irving Park. It was originally built by the Swedish International Order of Vikings in 1922. And then in 1958, it was taken over by the Chicago Latvian Association. So again, we purchased it in, in 2020. And the building um, remains almost exactly as it was when it was originally built. It includes, um, you know, different rooms throughout the building, as well as community gathering spaces, including a former tavern, 
um, two ballrooms and a museum. And so most of the building is currently being used as art studios. Um, my husband and I are creating a business called Color Club here, which is um, you know, focused around community and cultural programming. We have 10 artists that are currently renting art studios within the building and making work on site. And what we're here to do today is to apply for a public place of amusement license um, that would apply to one of the ballrooms, the museum and the former tavern so that we can rent those spaces for arts and cultural programming and events. So for example, um, theater shows, uh, children's programming, um, art classes, things that are more open to the public. The building has always been used as an events venue. Um, it has primarily hosted private events in the past. And what we would like to do is to be able to offer public programming as well. Um, my background is that I'm a community engagement consultant. I've been doing that for over 15 years, both in Chicago and in California. Um, I'm a trained meeting facilitator. So part of what I'll be doing is helping um, with the retreats and workshops that we host. Um, and then I'm also a professional event producer. And I'll let Josh share his background really quickly. Sure, uh, I'm a professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I teach painting and drawing. Um, I'm a professional artist myself and I um, am a co-director of the nonprofit gallery in East Garfield Park, Julius Caesar. Um, yeah. And I'm sorry, Josh, the first. There was some feedback, but I, I think we got everything. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, I can now. Yes. Good, good. Okay, so it sounds like I, I know there will be um, uh, an, an event space. And so you mentioned there will also be um, low rent studios for artists to use. Uh, is that kind of the day to day? Yes, the artists that are renting studios from us here are here pretty much every day working in their studios. Great. And um, can you like, I know you, you mentioned who, who had it before for events. What type of events previously were used? I know the events, it was an event space for 60 years by the order of the um, Vikings, I believe. What type of events did they have? <laughs> So, yeah, so it was the Swedish International Order of Vikings and then the Chicago Latvian Association. We know the most about the most previous owner, which is the Latvian Association, and they were using it as a banquet hall. Um, so they were renting the ballroom, um, tavern, actually both ballrooms as private event rental spaces. Um, so they were hosting you know, weddings, parties, quinceañeras, things like that. Um, we may do some of that, but our focus is really primarily arts programming. So we would like to be able to sell tickets to like comedy shows, um, theater events, dance performances. We have several tenants already that um, practice dance in the ballroom. And so for them to be able to have, you know, a recital and things like that for the public. Okay. And for certain ticketed events, how do you foresee any type of queuing occurring? You mean like outside the building? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, well, that's a good question. I, I don't imagine that we, that would ever really be the situation. We have um, plenty of entry space and, and tickets would be sold online in advance. So there wouldn't be like a box office on site. Okay. Okay, questions for the board and a reminder that we'll go to the objector um, after this, but initial, initial questions from the board. Uh, this is Commissioner Esposito. Can you describe um, sure. how food, beverages, and alcohol will be served or available? Yeah, so um, we plan on utilizing catering services for those that want to provide food at events. And until we have our own liquor license, we would do the same for alcohol service as well. Um, it would be sort of like ancillary concessions to the main events that are taking place in the building. So imagine like if we had a movie night in the ballroom, there would be, um, there's a, a lobby attached to the ballroom that would have concessions like, you know, your typical movie popcorn, as well as um, alcohol if people wanted to purchase that. Thank you.
Any other questions from the board before we move to the, the objector? Okay, we'll circle back at the end um, uh, for any type of closing um, from the applicant, but is Ms. Um, Trista Gunderman present? I am present, yes. Great, thank you, Ms. Gunderman. Will you state your name and address for the record? Absolutely. My name is Trista Gunderman. My address is 4106 North Hamlin Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Thank you. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I swear. Perfect. Okay, so what brings you here today? So um, I would just like to start off by noting that um, my opposition is really only relevant to a few of the concerns that come from the perspective of living next door to this space. Um, so my understanding is that the intent of this appeal is to shift the venue focus from a more of a community center to ticketed and private events. Um, and that would kind of shift the demographics from mostly local residents to a larger focus on others outside of the community. Um, in addition, it is my understanding that it would potentially increase the frequency of these larger events. So with an event capacity of up to 202 people and um, a not, no designated on-site lot, the new influx of non-community members would significantly impact the local par parking situation for community residents. Um, so Abby did note that there is offsite parking arrangements being worked out with a few local businesses, but the closest proposed parking lots are about a third of a mile and a half mile away from the location. Um, this would kind of turn the parking issue from this combined with the um, increase in free frequency of larger events could turn the parking situation for area residents from an occasional inconvenience to kind of a daily struggle to find parking when we get home from work. Um, they did mention another local business that they might be working with that is much closer. However, that local business is open until 10 p.m. on weekday nights. So that still wouldn't really alleviate the Monday through Friday parking problem. Um, my second concern is related to noise. So the wall of the 4106 apartments um, starts 15 feet from the wall where ballroom two is in the color club. Um, in addition, the complex's shared courtyard decks open to the same alley as the ballroom. Um, while they haven't held any larger events, music could be heard from inside the condos when the fire escape door to ballroom two was left open. Um, Abby did note that their staff and patrons will be made aware of the role to keep the door closed. However, I just wanted to emphasize that at residents of our association have little recourse if the event host kind of insists on the ballroom door being left open if the event is too hot due to a large capacity. Um, I would also like to acknowledge though that um, they're, they have been working with us in the sense of they um, initially proposed closing hours of 2 a.m. on Thursday nights. And that was a little bit of concern of a concern for us because some of us work early start jobs or have small children, but they did concede that they would be changing their closing hours to midnight on Thursday nights, which is appreciated. And those are my two main concerns with this um, request. Great, thank you. So um, the reason you see an increase in parking um, as opposed to the old event use is because that was more catered to the local community? Correct, and so we, uh, we would be walking instead of seeing people from outside of the community driving in. Okay. Any questions from the board for Ms. Gunderman? And Ms. Gunderman, do you have any questions while we're here um, for the applicant? Um, no, I just want to say that I really appreciate them um, having, taking the time to kind of confirm that they did commit to um, those reduced hours on Thursday nights. And so I just wanted to acknowledge and appreciate and tell them that we appreciate that. Yeah. And I would also say thank you for your time for coming today, just because um, I know this, there's often conversations before it gets to us, but this just adds to it and gives us good, um, good color. Um, and it sounds like, so the noise, the noise issue, I'm going to, when we circle back to the applicant, um, I'm going to have them address that. Um, 
in depth and it sounds like from your perspective, when the door is shut, it's okay. I haven't heard any noise in my condo when that door is shut. However, from my understanding, they haven't had any large events recently. Mm -hmm. And I did just move into my place in 2020. I do know that there was a history of complaints about the um, Latvian Association's larger events. However, I don't, I, I cannot speak to that personally. Okay. Sure. This is Commissioner Esposito. Um, I just wonder why are fire exit doors being left open? Would you like me to address that? Yeah, Ms. Monroe, yes. you can address that, yep. Um, so obviously we can't put a lock on the fire door because um, it's a emergency exit. So there right. is the ability to open it from the inside of the ballroom. It's never been left open intentionally. Um, I believe with like the seasonal change from, you know, spring into summer, one of our tenants had accidentally opened the door to cool down the room. And since that time, and, and Trista, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, we have issued a very strict, um, you know, rule within our rental community that that's absolutely not allowed going forward. There's new signage on the door um, to remind people that the fire door must remain closed at all times. And we're very aware of this is something that our staff and ourselves are going to be trained to keep an eye on during every event while they're, while there was a being held in the building. So I apologize that it happened this one time. Um, but now that we're aware of it being an issue, we'll absolutely make sure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Gunderman, any, um, any final words before we go back to the applicant for some questions? No. Um, do you want, would you like for me to stay on the call or should I leave? That's totally up to you. That's okay. totally up to you. We should wrap this up pretty quickly. So thank you. Yep. Okay. So uh, Ms. Monroe and uh, Mr. Deal, wondering if you can just generally discuss um, noise a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And, and these are all things that I'm about to share that I've already communicated to Tristan. And, and I think we both mutually understand that the noise could become a problem. And so we're very um, concerned about that ourselves and wanting to be good neighbors and making sure that we do whatever we can to, re to relieve that. Um, we will be putting blackout shades on all the ballroom windows so that any of our neighbors don't have to see what's going on in the, in the ballroom. They were only down um, during our painting period. And we'll also be installing um, soundproofing foam so that in addition to keeping the fire door closed, um, there really should be additional soundproofing coming out of, of that particular space. Um, we, we think that, you know, obviously we also did not attend events here during the time that the Latvian Association was hosting things, but it's our understanding that they pretty much only had private events, which were like you know, parties and um, sort of like louder celebrations like weddings and quinceaneras. And while we um, may do some of that type of programming, our focus is mostly in like the theater and arts space. And so our events will probably be ending around nine or 10 p.m. at the latest. You know, if you imagine like a comedy show, there's not, you know, a huge rowdy crowd attending something like that. So um, ultimately, we think the type of events that we'll be able to host with the PPA license will actually be quieter and more in the vein of a community activity than what was happening in the, in the building previously. Okay, thank you. Additional questions from the board? Yeah, I just have one question. Um, could you address the... Uh, uh, the issue about the parking. Uh, could you talk sure. about how much you, you expect people to drive and have to park uh, near the, the venue? Absolutely. So um, we are, because this building has been an events venue for over 50 years, we're not required by the zoning department to provide additional on-site parking. We have um, a parking credit determination letter from the Department of Planning and Development. Um, that being said, we still definitely understand that we need to provide parking in the, in the cases of larger events. And so we have an agreement now with a funeral parlor um, down the street. Um, it is within a mile of the building that, um, you know, has 40 offsite parking spaces that we can utilize any evening where we have an event 
um, that is a larger capacity event. And so we have that. We also have an agreement um, with Wintrust Bank down the street as well that um, has some additional parking that we can utilize. And like Tristan mentioned, we are also talking with our immediate neighbors, the grocery store across the street um, to supplement that further and are still in, that, in the process of negotiating that. So um, ultimately like our experience around the building is that there's been ample street parking. Um, we expect that our attendees will mostly take the blue line transportation, public transportation um, to our event. It's within walking distance as well as most people who are going out for the evening um, utilize, you know, um, uh, like Uber or Lyft or other um, vehicles of that nature. So we don't really foresee large hordes of cars, cars coming to our events, but in the case that they do, we will direct them to park in one of those lots. Uh, this is Commissioner Esposito once again, and can you describe the availability of parking on, you're on close to Elston, is that correct? Yes. And is yes, that I mean, we, available? No, it's not restricted. It's um, free unmetered parking. It's been very ample and uh, since we've been here and since April, 2020, we've never had an issue with ourselves or any of our tenants finding parking, including you know delivery trucks and things have all been able to pull up right to the building. Um, it seems that, that the parking issue is not really severe around here. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the board? All right, sounds like none. Um, thanks for this. We, it sounds like we have a lot of information on this and I appreciate um, Ms. Gunderman to take the time to, to come in and um, sounds like some things have been worked out as well. Um, so we'll, we'll take this under consideration and report back. I did wanna just add one more thing if that's possible. Sure, and I'm also um, being reminded Josh and that, I... I'm also being reminded that uh, the alderman might be here to say something. So Ms. Monroe, go right ahead and then I'm gonna see if the alderman wants to say something. Yes, I imagine she does. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that we did host a community meeting. Uh, we were not required to, but we were glad to host a community meeting to speak to um, the West Walker Community Association, as well as constituents of the Pulaski Ellison Business Association. And then also through the Alderman's office and our own newsletter publicized um, the opportunity to speak with us and learn more about what we're doing here. And we had over 35 people attend that meeting it was overwhelmingly positive support. Um, the opening remarks from West Walker Civic Association talked about, you know, this neighborhood having a 15 year vision plan for an arts and cultural use at this particular location. And they were, you know, like finally seeing their dreams come true to have that realized with our business proposal. So while I understand there are some, you know, small things that we need to work out in terms of making sure we're good neighbors, in general, I think what we're proposing here is exactly in line with what the community at large would like to see. Great, thank you, Ms. Monroe. Um, I know Alderwoman Nugent, uh, I believe is on the line. So let's see if she's available to say something. So Alderwoman Nugent, if you're available, oh, I see you going off mute. <laughs> so go, Hi, can you see me? Go. Sorry, yes. I'm also yeah. in another committee meeting, uh, but I am very supportive of this and I sent a letter of no objection. So I apologize, I'm in another, I'm in public safety as well right now. It's a multitask. Um, so th thank you for the time and consideration, but we did work with the civic organizations and, um, and uh, we've been working with the community and the civic organization, Wes Walker, uh, had no objection and we've been working with them. Uh, we also have no objection. So thank you for your time and consideration. Great, yeah, thank you so much for coming in with your support. We appreciate it, especially when um, it's a busy day. So thank you. <laughs> okay, have a great one, you guys. Bye-bye. Okay, um, so Ms. Monroe, again, we'll take this under consideration and thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you. All right, we're now going to take um, one more matter before we take a 15 minute break. So let's move to calendar number 239 21 S and 240 21 Z.
and while um, counselors getting situated, I'm gonna go ahead and read the department's recommendation. For the special use 239-21-S, the Department of Planning and Development recommends approval to establish residential use below the second floor to, con to convert an existing two dwelling unit building to three dwelling units. With a proposed two-story vertical addition and a four-story rear addition, provided that the development is consistent with the design and layout of the plans and drawings dated January 11, 2021, with elevations dated June 3rd, 2021, prepared by MC and Associates LLC. Um, Hello. for me. Yes. 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 Thank you. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman and um, esteemed members of the board. For the record, my name is Sarah Barnes and I'm an attorney with the losses of Sam Banks located at 221 North LaSalle Street. I'm happy to be here on behalf of the applicant Clark Apartments LLC. Joining us remotely on behalf of the applicant is it's one of its managing members, Bob Mangan. As well, we have two members of our design team that are joining us remotely, um, Michael Cox and Michael Moresso. And two, last but not least, we have our very revered MAI certified appraiser, Mr. O Terry O'Brien joining us. Um, so if it pleases you, Mr. Chairman, if you wanna go ahead and swear in my witnesses at this time. Yes, absolutely. So uh, Mr. Mangan, can you please state your name and address for the record? This is uh, Bob Mangan, 3905 North Hamilton, Chicago, Illinois. And do you swear or firm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Okay, and we'll get, um, the others on as well. So Mr. Cox, can you state your name and address, please? Yes, Michael Cox, 120 West Madison, Chicago, Illinois. And do you swear or to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Great. Um, Mr. Moresso, can you state your name and address? Michael Moresso, 120 West Madison, Chicago, Illinois, 60602. And do you swear or firm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Okay. Last but not least, uh, Terry O'Brien, can you state your name and address? Terrence O'Brien, uh, 87383 North Lincoln Avenue in uh, Lincolnwood, Illinois. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, sir, I do. Okay, and we, rec we acknowledge and recognize your expertise based off of many past appearances. Thank you. So much, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I begin, as one matter of housekeeping, I believe you already addressed it summarily with the recommendation from DPD, but I just wanted to be clear um, for your law department with regard to the final resolution and as well um, for the respective members of the board. Subsequent to the filing of this application, as well as the findings of fact, we were asked by DPD to add some additional references to the elevations that are a part of the plan package that provides the basis for this relief. Um, those insertions are only related to the materials that are you that were used for the existing building and the proposed um, additions. So there's no material changes to the height, the footprint, or the envelope of the building, even with the proposed additions. Um, those revisions on the elevations were dated June 3rd, 2021. Um, so I just ask that those are the proper elevations that go with the resolution and that are taken into consideration here today and made a part of the record. <laughs> Um, with that, and it seems that is the case. So with no further ado, back to the facts of the case. Um, the subject property is significantly substandard in depth, measuring only 100 feet deep. Therefore, it is 25 feet shorter than a standard city lot. Um, that property is presently improved with an older two-story with basement two-unit all residential building and a detached one-story garage. Um, original construction of this building and the um, garage dates back to 1906. 
The existing building is non-conforming under the current B32 zoning ordinance because it already contains a residential use or a dwelling unit below the second floor. Towards this very same end, the existing building as originally constructed well over 100 years ago contains two very small and fragmented dwelling units, one unit each on the first and second floor. The basement is completely unimproved and unoccupied. Um, the building as originally de designed again over 100 years ago features no meaningful or occupiable outdoor space for the residents of the building, but for the mandatory secondary access stair system off the rear of the building. As well and over time, the existing building and the units located therein have fallen into a state of disrepair and are very much in need of rehabilitation, improvements, and upgrades. The applicant who manages many other residential properties in this um, and the surrounding neighborhoods has owned and managed the subject property and, and improvements for several years. Unfortunately, due to the already described conditions, as well as evolving residential sentiments and needs, and despite their very best efforts, the applicant has had significant trouble keeping the two, um, dwell two existing dwelling units occupied, especially over the last couple of years. Based on the foregoing, the applicant is seeking to undertake a complete gut renovation of the existing building and the units located therein. The programming for which calls for the construction of a new two-story vertical addition above the building, as well as an, um, a new four-story addition at the rear of the building. By expanding the physical footprint and envelope of the building, the applicant is able to internally reconfigure and enlarge the two existing dwelling units and to add a third dwelling unit, which will make all of the proposed three dwelling units at the subject property more functional for families and work from home couples who are opting for rental living as opposed to home ownership at this time. In a further effort to meet the evolving needs of the families and individuals desiring to remain in this community while also improving the quality of life for the same, the rehabilitation plan also calls for the erection of a new three car masonry garage, which due to the substandard depth of the lot will be attached to the rear of the um, proposed new four-story addition. Um, as well, the programming for the new improvements includes um, the provision of various levels of private and communal outdoor space, including private balconies, terraces, and um, a couple of communal roof, communal roof decks. <clears throat> In order to permit the construction of the proposed four-story rear addition, one component of this rehabilitation plan, a single variation is required to reduce the required rear setback from 30 feet to two feet, which represents the location of the easternmost wall of the new one-story garage, not the principal building. And that's because it, it, that garage will again be attached to the principal building. So that for all practical purposes, the applicant will be maintaining and actually slightly improving the rear setback conditions created by the current one-story detached garage, um, which has, again, existed at the property for more than 100 years. In contrast, the four-story wall of the principal building, even with the rear addition, will actually be set back 22 feet from the rear property line, which is akin to the other existing residential buildings on this block of Clark Street. The rear setback, again, is only triggered in this instance because the applicant had to attach the garage to the principal building due to the substandard depth of the lot. To wit, if the subject site was standard in depth, um, 125 feet, then the applicant would not require the um, single variation because they would be able to detach the garage, um, therefore uh, making it not encroaching in the rear setback. Moreover, and also relevant to this request, the proposed rear addition, which measures just over 17 feet, 
in length will allow for the provision of an open kitchen and living area with direct access to two private terraces and a fourth bedroom, which could also be used for an office, a fitness um, room, or a playroom for growing families. <clears throat> As well, um, and that's for each of the duplex units. The, the addition will also allow for the provision of an additional master bedroom um, in the simplex unit. <clears throat> All of these improvements would have to be forfeited in order to maintain the 30 foot rear setback requirement on this significantly substandard lot. Aside from the proposed rear addition, which is the only part of the rehabilitation plan that triggers the variation, the design for the renovation and expansion of the existing building, including the two-story vertical addition and the establishment of an additional dwelling unit meets and or exceeds all of the other bulk and density requirements for the site under the current zoning ordinance. And that includes um, the front and side setbacks, floor, floor area ratio, height, and density. Not to be excluded from consideration, we are also here seeking a companion special use, which will bring the current non-conforming residential uses, i.e. the dwelling units that are located below the second floor of the existing and proposed rehab building into compliance under the current B32 zoning ordinance. Um, as you may have already gleaned from our findings of fact, as well as Mr. O'Brien's expert report, and as Mr. O'Brien will attest to here today, a residential use at grade level on this block of Clark Street in particular and in the immediate area is completely consistent and compatible with the other improvements. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, if there are no preliminary questions for me, I'm happy to quickly get on my witnesses and open it up for more questions. Uh, um, Chairman, I have one question for the counselor. You mentioned, and counselor, you know I was probably going to go here. You mentioned this is a substandard lot, uh, and I get that, but is it a substandard? How is there other lots in the neighborhood compared? Is this the only one that's substandard, or are there other ones in the neighborhood that are substandard? on each side of the building. Yes, Mr. Toya, this is one of the unique instances. Typically when we have a substandard site, it's on a block where all of the um, immediately adjacent row of lots are also carry the same conditions. This one, as you can see, from the exhibit that was prepared by the design team. Um, there's a varying rear setback um, and the lots are very irregular in size. So a couple of the buildings on, or sorry, excuse me, a couple of the properties on this block right. of Clark Street are um, also substandard. And then a couple of them are actually longer than standard, but irregularly shaped. So it creates a frustrating, um, obviously, typogra topographical um, condition when trying to fit a standard size building. Um, that being said, Mr. Toya and towards kind of, I think, hopefully, maybe where you're going with it, um, all of the other buildings on this block of Clark Street, um, if permitted today under the current zoning ordinance would require relief in order to be constructed because they do all have non-conforming conditions. Um, I know this particular applicant um, and design team and myself actually appeared before this same honorable board a couple years ago because they also um, own and redeveloped the um, bookend, the northernmost property on this block of North Clark Street. And we did in fact have to ask for rear setback relief because that one's not only substandard in depth, but it's also quite irregularly shaped. So um, I hope that addresses everything else. Um, when you start moving to the east and the west, then you start getting those straight um, residential streets where the properties tend to be more standard in size. Got it. Thank you. That was. Uh... Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, of course. Um, any other questions for me, preliminarily? No, so I guess prelimin pre preliminarily. I can't say that word right now. Um, how? What is the? How do you view the height difference between this building and the buildings in the surrounding neighborhood? Because it looks um, particularly tall. 
Um, there's a, it, yeah, it's diverse. Like I said, if you go to um, two properties down to the up, excuse me, to the north, then um, there's a larger five-story building. Uh, and then again, if you move towards the south end of the block, there's another three-story, four-story building. This subject property does happen to be um, situated amongst a couple of two-story older homes. Um, so it would be a little bit of a divergence from the immediately adjacent properties. Um, we've reached out to them, however, and there's no objection from the residents of those buildings, their apartment buildings. Um, as well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I should have mentioned this, we also um, met with Alderman Tunney and reached out to the local community organizations. Um, Alderman Tunney has issued a letter of support as well. Um, kind of sticking to the contextual height of the building. If you do move across the street on this same block of Clark, almost all of the buildings are very consistent in height um, to ours. And then as well, if you move to the east, there's several more three-story buildings. So it is a very, very diverse block, I will say, and a truly unique one at that. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, this is Commissioner Esposito. I have one clarification I'm asking for. You mentioned that the applicant developed another property. Did you say to the north? Yes, it's actually abutting the cemetery. It's that odd shaped, um, tri I don't have a cursor. So um, it's the odd shaped triangular piece. It's, I think, I believe it's two doors to the north. Yep, okay. exactly. Thank you, um, Ms. Vasquez. And Thank we you. were before the board. Let me see if I can find that. I think, I believe in 2018 for um, some relief related to that project. That again, we worked not only with um, the, with Alderman Tunney's office and the local community groups, but we actually had to work with um, CDOT in the Department of Planning and Development towards the um, redevelopment of that site. So that took us quite several years. Um, and again, it is the same team that's here today. So if you do have any questions regarding that project, um, we would be the appropriate ones to answer it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, great. Um, and again, Mr. Chairman, um, in the consideration of everyone's time, um, since I hope I gave you a pretty thorough summary of everything. I'm just gonna very basically put on my witnesses um, for the record. And then if there's specific questions to each of them, um, I'll, let, I'll open it right up to the board, if that's okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Mr. Mangan, may you please state your name and address for the record? It's Bob Mangan, 35, 3905 North Hamilton, Chicago, Illinois. I apologize. So sorry. This is the court reporter. Um, I can't hear Ms. Barnes. Oh, sorry. And sorry, I, fr I froze, but I'm, I'm back seemingly. So sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and I apologize. I'll try and speak louder. Um, Mr. Mangan, as I indicated, you and your brother, um, who actually have office, your offices in this same neighborhood, you've owned and managed several other properties in this same neighborhood, as well as the immediately adjacent neighborhoods. Is that right? And, and I'll, um, I'll quick, now that I'm uh, back on Frozen, I'm going to quick swear you in, Mr. Mangan. So, because, uh, well, actually, sorry, we swore everyone you in. That, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go right You're ahead. You're good. You're good. Um, so, and you've been um, in this particular field with your brother for over 25 years, right? Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and uh, with regard to the subject property, um, which again is has is improved with a rather old building that's kind of grown dysfunctional over time due to the fragmented dwelling units. Is it true that you have used your very best efforts to keep those those units occupied even at a reduced rent and are just having have been having trouble over the last couple of years? 
Yes, it's uh, they're hard to rent. <laughs> they, uh, most people want more amenities inside the apartments, and they're sort of dated at this point. Um, and in evaluating possible alternatives in order to make this property more viable and functional um, for the the community, and in talking with the aldermen, you could have. Um, actually raised or demolished the existing building and started anew and perhaps avoided some of these topographical conditions. Um, however, due to the um, character of the other improvements on this block, which are older in nature, um, you decided you would rehabilitate it and make the best use of it. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. We've worked um on other buildings similar type in the ward with Alderman Tunney and he uh, his uh, initial uh, thoughts were to save the building and keep the character of the neighborhood uh, of the older building so uh, that was our uh, intent was to try to keep the character of the neighborhood and bring the building up to modern standards. And I know um, you've done several of these types of rehabilitation projects in the 44th Ward in particular and in the historical districts, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And so even with the proposed additions, um, the design and programming for, for this rehabilitation will certainly still embrace the character of the, these more historic um, buildings, is that true? Yes, that is true. Thank you. Um, and lastly, just for the record, Mr. Mingan, prior to this hearing, you were provided with an affidavit um, as well as a copy of the applicant's findings of facts. If you were to continue to testify here today, would your testimony be consistent with the statements that were made in those documents? Yes, it would. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Chairman, would you like me to proceed with the other witnesses or is yeah, there go any ahead, questions? Go right ahead, Councilor. Okay. Um, Mr. Cox and Mr. Moresso, I'll kind of refer to you jointly. Um, Mr. Cox, though, will you please restate your name and address for the record? Sure. It's Michael Cox, 120 West Madison, Chicago, Illinois. Thank you. And um, once more, I know you've appeared before this board on several occasions, but you are a licensed design professional and structural engineer here in the state of Illinois. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and your offices were retained by um, Mr. Mangan and his brother in order to come up with and develop the programming for the rehabilitation of this building. Is that right? Yes. As well as the expansion. Um, and towards that end, as I indicated with Mr. Mangan, you too have worked on other rehabilitation projects in this very neighborhood and within the historic districts in this neighborhood um, with Mr. Mangan and his brother. Is that true? Yes. Um, and once more, in, in developing the programming for these types of rehabilitations, especially when there's an expansion involved, is it true that, too, that you take great deliberation and consideration of the character of the other improvements in the neighborhood when um, creating your design? Yes. And you did so here as well, is that right? That's correct. And again, some of those considerations um, are reflected in the plan package and those revised, re revised elevations that were provided to the Department of Planning and Development and to the staff prior to this hearing. Is that true? Yes. Um, and just real quickly with specific regard to the, this proposal, one of the most significant hardships around which or that you had to overcome in developing a program for the rehabilitation and in particular that rear addition um, is just the substandard depth of the lot. Is that correct? Yes. Um, as well, you were working with um, a structure that was built over a hundred years ago um, that had a quite significant front, front setback. Is that also true? Correct. So you had a limited space within which to work. Is that right? Yes. And towards that same end, um, if this property was standard in depth um, and you had that extra 25 feet, is it true that we likely wouldn't have to be here today seeking this variation because you could have detached the garage? Uh, correct, yes. Thank you. Um, 
Lastly, Mr. Cox, you too were, um, prior to this hearing, you were provided with an affidavit as well as a copy of the applicant's findings of fact. If you were to continue to testify here today, would your testimony be consistent with the um, statements that were made in those documents? Yes, it would. And then real, real quickly, even though it is in your affidavit, um, is it your professional opinion that um, the proposed single variation for the rear yard setback under these conditions does meet all of the standards and requirements for a variation as set forth under the current zoning ordinance? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, and then finally, Mr. O'Brien, may you please state your name and address for the record? Yes, Terrence O'Brien, O, apostrophe B, R, I, E, N, maintain offices at 7383 North Lincoln Avenue, Lincolnwood, Illinois. Thank you. And Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman has already recognized you as an expert in your field. Um, so with that, you were retained by the applicant in order to evaluate the subject property and the proposed improvements, as well as the surrounding neighborhood, and to determine whether or not a proposed special use to allow for the continuance of a residential use below the second floor um, meets all of the standards and criteria for a special use. Is that correct, Mr. O'Brien? That is correct, yes. And did you have an opportunity to go out to the site and to make those evaluations? Yes, I inspected the property on March 27, 2021. Um, and Mr. O'Brien, the evaluations that you made during your site visit and then your subsequent research, um, those were all put into a report that you prepared, is that correct, a written report? Yes, ma'am. And that written report as well contains your opinions with regard to the special use criteria. Is that also correct? Yes, I addressed the various criteria for special use as well as the criteria for the variations being sought by the applicant. And it was my professional opinion that the uh, applicant's request for these variations and special use it was uh, should be uh, allowed. They've met the criteria. And in fact, um, as already indicated, this the subject property has already had a residential use below the second floor for over 100 years. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. As well have um, at least six of the other buildings on this same block of Clark Street. Is that also true? Yes, everything on the east side of Clark Street from the parking lot to the north is residential ground floor uses. Great, thank you so much, Mr. O'Brien. So with that, um, Mr. O'Brien, just if you were to continue to testify here today, would um, the testimony that you give be consistent with the statements, evaluations, and opinions that are provided in your expert report? Yes. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, of course, Mr. O'Brien's report is a uh, was tendered to the board and is a part of this record. Um, so with that, we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, any additional questions from the board? We'll take it under consideration. Um, thank you everyone for your time. Thank, thank you. you. And we're gonna, Councilor, I know you're staying on for a couple. We're gonna take a 15 minute break right now. Um, so the break will go until 11.20 a.m. Central Standard Time. Um, so I'm going to motion for that recess. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner McDonald, say aye. Aye. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. Commissioner Esposito. Yes. Commissioner Toya. Yes. And I'm a yes. So again, we will reconvene at 11.20 a.m. here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, I move that we reconvene this meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeal. Commissioner Toya second. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. I vote yes. We are back. Um, so now let's move to calendar number 241-21-Z at 3419 North Paulina, Paulina Street. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman um, and esteemed members of the board. Once more, for the record, my name is Sarah Barnes, and I'm an attorney at the Law Offices of Sam Banks, located at 221 North LaSalle Street. I'm happy to be here this afternoon on behalf of the applicant, who just so happens to be the same applicant um, as we had in the last case, Bob and John Mangan. As well, joining us remotely once more um, are two members of their design team, Michael Cox and Michael Moresso. Um, so that probably makes things easy on your end, Mr. Chairman, because each of my witnesses has already been sworn in. So if that works for you, we can just continue with the case. Yep, perfect. It's on the record that they've all been previously sworn in. So thank you, Counselor. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the subject property is located just off of Lincoln Avenue on the other side of the elevated train tracks that traverse Polina Avenue. This part of Polina Avenue, therefore, provides a meaningful transition between the larger scale, more intensive commercial operations and higher density residential uses along Lincoln Avenue as you move into the lower density family oriented residential improvements of this part of the West Lakeview neighborhood. The subject site consists of two contiguous lots of record, which together measure approximately 50 feet in width by 125 feet in depth. However, truly unique to this property and creating a frustrating condition for the applicant and their design team is that there is a four foot wide permanent restrictive easement that encumbers the entire depth of the site along the north side. This easement expressly prohibits any improvements on this part of the property. As such, for all practical and functional purposes, the subject site is substandard in width, width in comparison to a site of similar composition, with the applicant losing over 500 square feet of otherwise buildable area along the north side of the site. This condition is even more relevant and onerous in this instance because but for the easement, the applicant could construct a building that spans the entire width of the site, i.e. with a zero side setback on each side, completely as of right under the current B23 zoning ordinance. Towards these very same ends, and what brings us before this honorable board here today is that the applicant is seeking to redevelop the subject site with a new four story residential apartment building, which will feature a total of 14 dwelling units located on and between the first through fourth floors. Due to the easement, as already described, the applicant had to shrink the footprint of the proposed new building in width by at least four feet. As such, in order to provide meaningful and functional habitable space for the residents of each of these units, and two, in order to provide the required secondary means of internal ingress and egress, um, which in this case are two stair corridors for each of the units, the applicant had to extend the depth of the building by approximately seven feet, which in doing so still accounts for only 350 square feet of that 500 square feet that was lost by the easement. So that if the applicant was able to build over the four foot wide easement um, and design a wider building, which again is allowed as of right, then the applicant would not require the single variation for the modest rear setback reduction of seven feet because the building could be shorter but still functional. Even still, in an effort to mitigate any incidental or perceived impact packed on any of the adjacent properties, the applicant decided to forego internal parking, otherwise 
usually provided in a garage for the proposed new building and instead to provide completely open surface parking for the residents at the rear of the site. This allows them to maintain a 23 foot rear yard setback, which is completely open. Um, this open design for the parking allows, again, there to be over 23 feet of unoccupied and unencumbered space between the public alley and the rear wall of the four-story principal building, thereby actually improving the rear setback conditions that previ previously existed at the property for over 100 years when there was a two-story coach house that was situated directly on the rear property line and that occupied almost the entirety of that rear yard. <clears throat> um, aside from the small seven foot reduction in the required setback, therefore, the design for the new proposed building meets and or exceeds all of the other bulk and density requirements for the site under the current zoning ordinance and that includes without limitation, the front and side setbacks, floor area ratio, height and density. Towards the same end, um, trying to be proactive, some of you may be asking yourself, why not shorten the building and add another floor? So go vertical with the building. Since the proposed new building is over 12 feet shorter in height than otherwise allowed under the current zoning classification. The answer to that is twofold. Going 12 feet one, going 12 feet taller would be far more imposing on the other adjacent properties than would be reducing the length or lengthening the building um, a mere seven feet. Um, which gets us to the second prong of that. The applicant is actually prohibited from going taller with the building at the request and the direction of the local alderman and the local residents and community organizations, all with whom the applicant spent almost a year engaging um, towards creating the programming for this building. As a matter of relevant history, therefore, back in and around September of 2020, City Council ratified a type one zoning map ordinance, changing the zoning for the subject site to the current B23 classification. And that was pursuant to the same exact set of architectural plans that provide the basis for the subject variation. Prior thereto, the applicant and its design team, including myself, spent many months working with Alderman Matt Martin and the 47th Ward Zoning Advisory Committee as well as engaging with the North Center Chamber of Commerce and some of the other residents in the neighborhood towards the design and programming for the proposed new building. Much of the design and functional features of and for the proposed new development were driven by and as a result of that meaningful community review, including agreeing to cap the building at four stories. And two, it was represented throughout this underlying process that the applicant would require this variation for the modest reduction in the rear setback in order to rectify the deficiency created by the easement while also accommodating the public interests. Accordingly, we are very pleased to advise that not only has the alderman extended his continued support for this proposal with regard to the necessary variation, but the applicant has also um, received express letters of support from both of the immediately adjacent neighbors. Copies of all of those letters, Mr. Chairman, um, have been tendered to your staff and should be a part of your record. Um, in fact, the letters of support from the neighbors as well as the original letter of support from Alderman Martin were a part of the applicant's findings of fact, Exhibit D. And the alderman, um, just as of, I believe, Tuesday, provided an updated letter of support, which he tendered directly to your staff. Um, so with that, once more, if there are no preliminary questions of me, I am very happy to put on my witnesses and let you uh, and open it back up to more questions. Okay, and yeah, Councillor, and I know um, we say this a lot, but you can uh, go the streamlined version of um, the witnesses, just because we do have all of this in your findings of fact, um, and which yeah. we have to do. And um, worth noting that your findings of fact are amongst the strongest. So like, <laughs> we can rest a lot on that and really speed up the summaries. 
I got you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'll keep it short then from here on out. Um, Mr. Mangan, may you once again please state your name and address for the record. This is Bob Mangan, 3905 North Hamilton, Chicago, Illinois. And just real quickly, Mr. Mangan, you um, were personally involved in all of the community review for this project. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And everything that I've stated here on, herein is accurate to the best of your knowledge. Is that right? Yes, yes, it is. And to and towards those same ends, um, prior to this hearing, you were provided with an affidavit as well as a copy of the applicant's findings of fact. If you were to continue to testify here today, would your testimony be consistent with the statements that were made in those documents? Yes, it would. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Cox and Mr. Moresso, in particular, Mr. Cox, can you, may you once more please state your name and address for the record? Yeah, sure. Michael Cox, 120 West Madison, Chicago, Illinois. Thank you. Um, and again, Mr. Cox, you are a licensed design professional and structural engineer in the state of Illinois. Is that right? That's correct. And you were once more um, retained by the applicant in order to develop the programming for this new um, multi-unit residential building. Is that right? Yes. Um, and you and Mr. Moresso too participated in the underlying community review for this project. Is that correct? Yes. And again, the practical hardship in this instance in particular is that four foot wide easement that runs along the entirety of the north side of the property. Is that correct? That's correct. And that um, because of that easement, you could not make the building wider, although you would be allowed to as of right, but you had to go deeper with the building. Is that right? Correct. Um, and lastly, Mr. Cox, you too were provided with an affidavit as well as um, a copy of the applicant's findings of fact prior to this hearing. If you were to continue to testify here today, would your testimony be consistent with the statements therein? Yes, it would. And does that include your opinions that the proposed um, variation, which will allow for a slight reduction in the required rear setback, does based on the conditions of this site, does meet all of the standards and criteria for a variation as set forth under the current zoning ordinance? Yes. Thank you. Um, it's all yours, Mr. Chairman and other esteemed commissioners. We are happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, any questions from the board? Not surprised you covered it all, counselor. So we'll take Sorry. Them, we'll, no, it's fine. We'll take this under consideration. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you very much. Yep. Enjoy the weekend. Okay, we're now going to be moving to calendar number 242-21-Z, and this is at 2442 West Thomas. Um, okay, good. My, my clients made it on. They were a little nervous that, that they were stuck in purgatory or something. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, you are stuck with me for one more, but I will heed your advice. Um, you. Although this one's a little unique because it's not a developer-based um, project, um, and as well, it just has some odd facts. But um, I will still keep it brief and rely mostly on my findings of fact. Great. Um, with that, though, um, I do have a couple of new witnesses and a couple of the same witnesses. So if we could swear in the new witnesses after I do the introductions, that would be great. Um, so real quickly, and for the last time today, for the record, my name is Sarah Barnes, and I'm an attorney with the Law Offices of Sam Banks, located at 221 North LaSalle Street. I am very happy to be here this morning or afternoon, if it is already, on behalf of the applicants, Marco and Patricia Ionessa, who are joining us both remotely from their home. Um, and then as well, we still have our same or two members of that same design team, Michael Cox and Michael Moresso. Um, so Michael Cox and Michael Moresso have been sworn in, but um, Mr. Chairman, if it pleases you, um, we can swear in the Ionessa, Mr. and Mrs. Ionessa. Perfect. So yeah, first, Mrs. Ionessa, if you could state your name and address, please. 
Yes, this is Patricia Ionessa, and our address is 2442 West Thomas Street, Unit 1. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Great. Um, and now, Mr. Ionessa, can you state your name and address as well? Marco Ionessa, 2442 West Thomas Street, Unit 1, Chicago. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Did you, did you say yes? Just yes. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to acknowledge on the record that we have both of Mr. Cox and Mr. Moreso um, sworn in. Thank you so much. Um, if, as my mother used to do as a school teacher, I could give a golden star to any of my clients, it would for sure be Mr. and Mrs. Ionessa. I have never um, seen such incredible prudence from a couple of lay people, so to speak, um, in properly following all of the rules, which can sometimes be quite onerous and confusing. Um, so I just want to start by commending them. They truly, truly did this the right way um, when given some very unique circumstances. And I say that because um, the existing building, which is, um, it's an existing three-story with basement, um, three-unit condominium building, so ownership building, very akin to what you see in this neighborhood, um, as well as the detached, corresponding detached garage, were originally constructed based on the records and from what we can glean back, they finished construction back in 2016. And that was with a um, previous developer whom we cannot locate uh, despite our best efforts. Um, and that's obviously the developer was not the applicants. Um, as well, the design for the building um, and the permitting, it was properly permitted, both the principal building and the detached garage which includes a roof deck, although no access structure to that roof deck. Um, those were all properly permitted back in 2016. Again, however, uh, once more, the design of those two structures, um, including the roof deck, were prepared by a completely different architect and design team, not Mr. Moreso and not Mr. Cox. And we too, have been, been unable to locate that architect because we cannot access um, the architectural plans because they are privileged under FOIA. So despite our best efforts, um, we kind of started anew here. And with that as well, the INSAs are not the first owners of their particular unit. They did um, recently in 2020, they purchased the first floor duplex unit um, from uh, the previous unit owner, who is actually um, a Chicago police officer. And they did that with the intention of making this their primary residence um, within which they could start and grow um, a family. They purchased that unit with the understanding based not only on marketing materials, but representations made along the way. And most probably importantly, um, a provision in the condominium declarations stating that um, the owners of the first floor unit or unit number one would be deeded the exclusive rights to the deck above the garage and that is because otherwise there is no meaningful outdoor space for that unit. Um, that being said, as I described and is um, in my findings of fact, there was never an access structure that was permitted for the deck. So although they can technically use it, they have no way to access it. So um, their real estate agent, thank goodness, um, was prudent enough to advise that a permit would be required for an access structure. They were then, re the INSs were then referred to Mr. Cox and Mr. Moreso to come up with a design for that access structure that could be permitted. Um, and as well, I was a part of that referral. So we've gone through all of the proper steps in order to permit an access structure that will provide um, a means of the INSs to get over to that um, access or to that roof deck. Uh, unfortunately, I know this board 
is not a super fan of the elevated connections. But as you can see from the photographs that were also a part of the supplemental findings of fact, there is no place to put um, the gap between the principal building and the rear accessory structure, um, the rear um, access structure that's required and the garage is so slight that it would actually be impossible, we tried, believe me, to um, put in stairs that would run parallel to the back wall because if we attempted to do that, not only would we require a variation because we would be um, interrupting the contiguous rear yard open space that's also required under the ordinance, but probably more meaningfully and concerningly, we would be um, obstructing emergency ingress and egress um, for the other residents and the INSAs out of that building. Um, so instead, we are proposing to do a very, very small um, connection between the rear port, the rear access stair of the first floor unit, the INS's unit, and the garage. It's only about um, three, that landing is about three, measures about three feet in width by just under five feet in length. And it is um, flush with, as you can see here, the principal building wall. So it is set back from the adjacent, set back on the side from the adjacent properties. Um, towards that end, in consideration of this variation, the INSAs went out and they met with all of the residents on the block door to door, sat down with them, um, and we submitted, I believe uh, over 10 letters of support from the residents on the block for the proposed new improvement or the proposed new landing as well um, the other two residents of the building and members of the condo association have provided their express support um, these types of elevated access structures and garage decks are quite prominent on this block of thomas street as well as both of the immediate residential streets. In fact, just one door over, um, there is a six unit building that's a little wider than this building, but they have a six car garage and it's in the photographs. Yep, oh, back one, Miss Vazquez, if you don't mind, right there. Um, that larger deck, they similarly have a access structure bridge. Um, and I believe, I don't think they actually had to appear before the board. I think they permitted that prior to these variations, but it's a it's a common amenity um, in this neighborhood for sure. So uh, with all of that, I will quickly get on the witnesses and open it up for questions. <laughs> um, Mr. and Mrs. Ayanessa, can you each state your name and address once more for the record? Yes, Patricia Ayanessa. 2442 West Thomas, Unit 1. Marco Ayanasa, 2442 West Thomas, Unit 1. Thank you. And I'm, I'm not going to take up any more of the board's time um, asking you all, the, the, all of the questions, the answers to with, I think, which I think I just relayed, but um, are all of the statements that I just made in my opening, um, are those accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes, ma'am. And it, it reflects a history of your involvement with this property? It does, yes. Um, towards that same end, you both were also given affidavits as well as a copy of our findings of fact prior to this hearing. Um, if you were to continue to testify, would your testimony be consistent with the statements made in that in those documents? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and then real quickly again, Mr. Cox, may you please state your name and address once again, for the record. Sure. It's Michael Cox, 120 <laughs> West Madison, Chicago, Illinois. And um, Mr. Cox, you, um, again, are a licensed design professional and structural engineer in the state of Illinois. Is that correct? That's correct. And in this instance, um, you were actually retained by the applicants to only design um, the access structure that would provide um, use of the already erected roof deck above the garage. Is that correct? Correct. And is it also true that you and Mr. Moresso had no part in the design of the um, principal building or that detached garage? That's correct. 
Uh, thank you. And um, Mr. Cox, once more, despite your best efforts in coming up with alternative design remedies for the access structure due to not only the substandard depth of the property, but also um, the orientation of the existing as of right improvements, the only way that you could provide access to that roof deck was through that small landing. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and otherwise, this <clears throat> Hey, I'm, counselor, your sound, your sound cut off a little bit. You're muffled. Oh, I'm sorry. That's probably because I'm being redundant and it sh <laughs> should cut me off anyways. Yeah, I didn't um, mute you. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> I need to mute myself. Um, I was just saying, Mr. Cox, um, there was really no other design alternative and certainly none that would not, would not require us to come before this board for a variation. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, so with that, is it your opinion that the variation we are seeking here today to allow for the erection of that very small um, landing does in fact meet all of the standards and requirements for a variation as set forth under the current zoning ordinance? Yes. Thank you. And lastly, um, you as well were provided with an affidavit and two, a copy of the applicant's findings of fact prior to this hearing. If you were to continue to testify, would your testimony be consistent with the statements that were made in those documents? Yes, it would. Thank you very much. And with that, I will very happily open it up to questions. Okay, questions from the board. Counselor, for me, can you succinctly just restate the hardship here? Yeah, it's um twofold, so maybe threefold. But we are we do have a substandard lot, so it is shorter, um, five foot shorter. If it was five foot longer and a standard lot, then it is conceivable, though not probable that we could do one of the Hopkins stair structures that runs parallel to the rear of the garage that would not require relief and that also would not um, obstruct that, again, that emergency pedestrian ingress and egress at grade level. Um, however, the not probable part of that and another hardship is that we had to work with the orientation of the two existing structures, the principal building and the detached garage, um, because of the front setback and the length of the existing building, there was that even further shrunk the area between the garage and the principal building. So that even again, if we could come before this board for a variation for that, um, that at grade stair structure that runs parallel, we would um, be obstructing the ingress and egress, that emergency secondary ingress and egress for the other residents and the INSs of the building. Um, and then lastly, which is just inherent in all of these is that obviously the garage deck is considered as of right. However, you're not, you can't, we in this instance wouldn't have a way to access it without coming before this board. So um, that's the practical hardships. Obviously the INSs did assume some finan financial risk and hardships in all of this as well. Um, but those are kind of secondary to the design hardships. And then, and you said we we just don't know who the developer is. No, and we um we went back. We tried. We went into the public records. We couldn't locate the developer. Um, we do believe, based on the design, that he might he or she may have designed other building, another at least one other building on this block. And then same thing, we did a Freedom of Information Act um, request to the Department of Buildings and the Department of Planning and Development to see if we could find out who the architect was. Um, and again, the, the plans at least are subject to privilege because they're work product. So we came up with zero results there too. Okay. Okay, and then, any other questions from the board? 
Yeah, just real. I just want to clarify, a counselor <clears throat> aren't all the lots in this part of on this block of substandard because I know a lot of the uh, lots in the first ward, especially in this part of the first ward, are substandard lots. Yes, sir, you are absolutely correct. All uh, of yeah, the we, got a, we got a new member on the board, so I just want to make sure she understands <clears throat> when substandard lots comes up that it's different parts of the city. So, uh, but I know this part of the city, they're all substandard lots. Yeah, for the most part, that is absolutely oh, no, true. The super majority of the parts. No, oh, yeah, and uh, and in particular, Commissioner, on this block, they all are. You are yeah. absolutely correct. Um, and once again, because of that condition, that is common amongst the other buildings. Like I said, most of them have non-conforming conditions, in particular with the um regard to these accessory structures um because it just is difficult to build a standard improvements on a substandard like especially i, I just want to make sure they were you know there's different characters to different neighborhoods so i just want to make absolutely. sure absolutely you know, yes my Bucktown, colleagues understand the character of this neighborhood yes this neighborhood is known for their short lots and their yes. large short lots large buildings <laughs> all right this is, thank you for for this is um i have a question Right. Did this did this rear setback to begin with is it conforming? Or not? Yes, uh, the rear setback for the principal building. Yes. Yeah, it's actually thirty-four feet. I think um, it's in my findings of fact. So really, if not for the depth of the back porches, it would be possible. And um, yeah, the depth of the back porches and the depth of the garage, it's a three car garage. It's pretty deep though. Um, right. I don't know if you can see on that site plan, but. And then I, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that the applicant's particular unit has no access to, I think you used the term meaningful outdoor space. Can you describe the meaningful outdoor space the other units enjoy? Um, because they're elevated, they can use the rear porch structure um, for for like outdoor furniture, especially. Um, and then without being encumbered by the other unit above. So what happens with the INSs, and I think you can see it in the um, photographs, but where their um, front door, yeah, so they're, again, I don't have a cursor, but where their porch is situated, their rear porch, so to speak, on that secondary stair is located. They have the garage and the principal building and the unit above them kind of sandwiching them in. Um, once you get to the second floor unit, they're above the garage, so they don't have that. And then the third floor unit has access to a deck above the um, building. And again, that's an as of right amenity. Does that help Commissioner Esposito? Yes, yeah, that's a, that's a very good picture. Thank you. Showing the INS is kind of being sandwiched between the building and the um, garage. And again, the second floor doesn't have that encumbrance. Um, may I uh, add something as well? This is Mike Moresso. Sure, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Yep. Um, the existing building does encroach the rear yard setback by about a foot or 16 inches. So the rear yard is reduced uh, because of the existing building being built over that rear yard setback line. So although they did get permits, it's Either they built beyond the scope of the permit because the permit was for a compliant building. Um, we don't really know. Again, based, thank you, Mike, for the clarification. Um, we're not really sure how that happened. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any more questions from the board? Okay, we'll take it under consideration and thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you so thank much. You. Have thank a great you, weekend, everyone. Thanks. Stay safe. Thank you. Happy Juneteenth. Yep, you too. Thanks.
I'm going to move right along to um, a string of cases. It's calendar number 243-21-S, 244-21-Z, and 245-21-Z. Um, as counselor gets situated, I'm going to read the department's recommendation. For calendar number 243-21-S, the Department of Planning and Development recommends approval to establish a new medical use in an existing two-story building, provided that the special use is issued solely to the applicant, healthcare alternative systems, and the development is consistent with the design and layout of the plans and drawings dated November 9, 2020, prepared by Revolution Architecture with landscape plan dated June 18, 2021. Hi, um, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me all right? Yes, is this um, Councillor Cassell? Castle, yeah, Danielle. Perfect, yes, we can hear you. Um, oh, you know what, I think I didn't hit start video. There, there I there, am. There, we can, we can hear and see you. Okay, um, great, thank you so, so go, much. Go right ahead, Councillor. Thank you, um, and uh, Mr. Chairman, is the intent that we can handle all three cases at once? Yes, yes. That would be wonderful. Thank yep. you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Danielle Meltzer Castle. I'm an attorney at Vetter Price and very proud to be here on behalf of Healthcare Alternative Systems in these three matters. Um, I really, we all really put so much effort into the findings of fact and the affidavits that we will try to be as brief as possible. And if you feel like we're being too brief and would like more detail uh, during these proceedings, we are more than happy uh, to supplement for sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the DPD staff for their favorable recommendation. And I also really wanna thank Victor and Janine and Jeanette, um, Steve Valenciano and Ron Day, because they've been working on this for us uh, for three years. And we were approved all three matters by the ZBA in 2019. Unfortunately, due to COVID and healthcare alternative systems mission, they just had to absolutely focus on their clients in crisis and in their staff. And they were unaware that the uh, special use and variations that were approved in 2019 would lapse. And even if we did apply for a one-year extension on the special use, that wouldn't have applied uh, to the two variations because the code doesn't uh, have an extension mechanism there. I also wanna more recently, uh, from their more recent involvement, thank uh, Nancy and Brian for making a couple of uh, suggestions about additional information to put on the landscaping plans the ones that are dated for today. But I would like to note for the record that all we were essentially doing was noting the locations of existing street trees and um, attaching uh, plans that give the details on the species that will be installed in the new parking lot. Really no material information that uh, was missing from our findings of fact or uh, wouldn't otherwise come out during the building permit process. Uh, so I've introduced myself and more importantly, I'd like to introduce the folks from the applicant and the development team who are here. We have uh, Melissa Fentress and Nilia Don and Marco Hakame, all from Healthcare Alternative Systems. We have Chris Fry, our project architect, and we have Kareem Mosawir, who is our uh, land use planning expert. If it's all right, I'd like to have those five folks sworn in by you, Mr. Chairman. Yep, and, let's, uh, and let's have them. Great, thank you. So we'll get them all sworn in. So um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing any names, but uh, Mr. Jacome. Present. If you could please state your name and address. Uh, my name is Marco Hakome. I'm, uh, the CEO of Healthcare Alternative Systems, 2755 West Armitage, Chicago, Illinois, 60647. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Hakume. Um, Ms. Adan, can you state your name and address, please? 
Yes, my name is Millie Adan. My address is 3815 South California Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60632. And do you swear or affirm and tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Uh, Ms. Fentress, can you state your name and address? Melissa Fentress, 116 Eastern Avenue, Bellwood, Illinois, 60104. Thank you, Ms. Fentress. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's sure. proceedings? Yes. Great. Okay, um, Kareem Musawir, if you could state your name and address. Yes, Kareem Musawir, 221 North LaSalle Street in Chicago. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? The land use consultant. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, yeah, Kareem, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Sorry, my screen has, has frozen on this end. Okay, can you hear me? We'll circle. We'll circle back to you, Kareem, um, when, when, if, and when you're up. Um, okay. So, uh, Christopher Fry, can you state your name and address? Sure, uh, Christopher Fry, 82 South of Grange Road, the Grange, Illinois. And do you swear from tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Great. All right, thank you. Go right ahead, Councilor. Thank you so much. So very, very high level overview. Healthcare alternative systems is a long-standing, highly respected nonprofit that provides supportive healthcare services around the city and suburbs. And um, sadly, actually, the, the demand just keeps growing. And they found this location, a uh, long vacant, um, previously uh, a manufacturing facility. Our sellers uh, owned both this building and the parking lot to the rear. There's a 16 foot alley that uh, bisects the building from the parking lot. And historically, that parking lot in the rear has always provided the accessory parking for this building. Uh, this is uh, in a plan manufacturing district in which medical uses are allowable, but only with a special use. That's our special use approval. Uh, in addition, there are a number of interior columns and conditions that are shown on the submitted floor plans that really precluded us from having um, parking uh, interior to the building. So we were really left uh, with only the number of parking spaces that we could eke out of the parking lot. And that is why we're seeking the variation to reduce the amount of required parking for the principal building to the number that we can establish in the parking lot. And then of course, because there's that bisecting alley, we also need the variation to allow the parking lot to serve as the accessory parking for the um, principal building. And I'm about to turn it, I'm about to turn to um, having each of the five witnesses acknowledge their affidavits. But before I do, I, I would like to point out one typo that I am responsible for. And that is in the three sets of findings of fact that you have, um, I have no edits to uh, the special use findings of fact, uh, no edits to the findings of fact with respect to the parking amount variation, but there is a typo in the first page of the findings of fact with respect to the offsite parking um, where mistakenly there is just a duplicate reference to the parking amount variation. So I hope that staff um, and the board will just take notice of that as well as the five um, witnesses as we go through the next, next step. Yep, so thank I'd you, like Council. To, we'll, we'll note that on the record. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Okay, I'd like to just very briefly begin with Marco. Um, Marco, is it true that you are the Chief Executive Officer of the uh, applicant? Correct. And that you executed the affidavit with 42 statements that was submitted 
to the Zoning Board of Appeals for all three matters. That's correct. Great. And you took notice of the typo I mentioned earlier? Yes, correct. Thank you. If we were to have you testify today during these proceedings, would your testimony be consistent with those 42 statements? Yes. Great, thank you so much. And there may be further questions either for me or for members of the board. Millie. Yes. Are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Great, Millie, this is gonna sound very familiar. Um, is it true that you are the vice president of human resources for the applicant? Yes, that's correct. And is it true that you executed it, the affidavit um, submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals with 42 statements and that if you were to testify today, they would, all of your testimony would be consistent with the 42 statements? Yes, that's correct. And you took note of my typo? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Melissa. Good morning. Good morning, Melissa. Is it true that you are the director of finance for the applicant? Yes. And is it also true that you executed the affidavit that was submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals with the 42 statements? And if you were to testify today, um, your testimony would be consistent with that affidavit subject to my typo correction? Yes. Excellent. Chris? Yes. yes. Is it yeah. Hi, Chris Fry. Is it true that you are the project architect? Yes. And that you executed the affidavit included with the CBA that contains four statements. And if you testified today, your testimony would be consistent with those. Yes. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, hello, Kareem. Can, do we yes. have a good connection with you now? I hope so. Great. Okay, so great. And I'll, I want a quick, I want a quick swear him in. Um, so Kareem, we got your name and address, but can you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Kareem, uh, is it true that you are the land use consultant to the applicant for the special use matter? Yes. Thank you. And that you executed and or provided the affidavit and the expert report that is included in the application? Yes. And if you were to testify today, uh, or we were to walk one by one through the special use standards, is it true that your testimony would be consistent with your report and consistent with your affidavit and that you and your professional experience and uh, familiarity with the property and the project have concluded that the proposed um, healthcare alternative systems medical use will comply with all of the five standards for a special use approval. Yes, all of that is true. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I will really turn it over to the chairman. I am more than happy to give more information and we are all here to answer your questions. Yeah, um, so I'd like to just hear, since it is a special use, a little bit um, from Mr. Hakome and Ms. Adan um, and Ms. Fentress, just people involved with the applicant, specifically on, um, on the services that will be provided and on who it's serving in the RAC community, um, and really any general information on the project. Sure, I, I can start. Perfect, uh, thank you. Can you hear me, everybody? So um, again, my name is Marco Hockman. I'm the CEO of Healthcare Alter Systems. I've been in the organization for 35 years. The organization um, uh, provides um, for the last 45, 49 years a behavioral health, uh, per particular substance abuse and mental health services for the most uh, needed communities. We have 10 locations in the city of Chicago already and three in the suburbs. Um, we provide the whole continuum of behavioral health, which is substance abuse treatment, an intensive outpatient program, and also a residential program. We have two small residential programs that address the needs of people with uh, chronic conditions. Um, in the mental health, also we do a, a whole spectrum of mental health, but not the chronic conditions. So, um, uh, and we recently have innovated some of the programs called the living room concept, which is a crisis stabilization for mental health. Uh, we're seeing a magnitude of 7,000 participants a year. 
we all the clinicians are, are credentialed or certified by the state. We're national accredited by CARF. Uh, actually, it's international accreditation. Uh, we've been have a national accreditation for, for the last, since I've been in the organization, uh, 30, 30, 35 years. I'm a clinician by trade. And then, um, you know, through the last 25 years, I've been running the organization. Um, we have uh, doctors aboard, we have nurses aboard, uh, we have all masters level who do clinical work, uh, either for mental health or substance abuse, special programs like postpartum depression psychotherapy, domestic violence, um, you know, for victims and abusers, uh, we, we have in separate buildings. But again, you know, we've been working in the community, um, most needed communities in, 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 in the city of Chicago and the, three, in the, in the West suburbs. We have three offices in Wheaton, um, Melrose Park and Broadview. Uh, and actually in addition in, in, in Park Ridge recently, which has opened up an office there uh, with the opportunity to continue doing the, the substance abuse treatment. Um, I'm not sure, again, we're committed to the cause. Um, I've been dedicated my life to help people in need. Um, and I'm proud of that, so mm -hmm. I'm excited. Yeah, and I, Mr. Chairman, I would also like to add that we included with our application materials and our findings of fact, the most recent uh, annual report, as well as uh, 23 support letters. I think Paz has been so dedicated and very respected. And some of those support letters are from neighbors showing that we're good neighbors ourselves. And we've also worked with the aldermen throughout this whole process. Yep, great. Yeah, thank you. It's an important mission. Um, so thank you for all the work. Um, any questions from the board? I guess one thing I just want to touch on um, uh, before we move on, you know, with the parking reduction, um, I know you, I know, Council, that you touched on it, but do you expect that the reduction in parking will be made up with public transportation, um, we just like to make sure that, make double sure that there won't be extra traffic um, created. Absolutely. So if I can just highlight a couple of things that are in our, our findings of fact and, and just put some emphasis on them. One is that every one of our affiants, Marco, Melissa, Millie, they've all been involved with us for a significant amount of time and each of them has attested to the fact that they think the uh, amount of parking is going to be more than adequate. Um, and there are several, several reasons for that. One is that they are serving such a low income community. Their clientele don't own cars. They, they can't afford cars. They are using public transit and Haas even provides public transit vouchers um, to many of their, of their clients. And they picked this location as they have to in every case to make sure there's um, decent uh, public access, uh, you know, public transit access. And sometimes also family members might have a car and they would be able to drop clients off. That's a very typical pattern as well. And, uh, you know, another factor is they can stagger their programming so that the occupancy of the building at any one time isn't uh, overwhelming for the space. And that includes the, you know, the, the parking space and when, when staff need to be there. So they would not have invested all of the money they did in buying this location with this amount of parking if they didn't think it was going to be adequate. And, you know, frankly, I would also note that um, it, I think it's only a three space variation that we're getting. I mean, it's, we, we think we can get 26 spaces in there. Okay. We, we hedged down to the 23 at a point in time when, you know, we really weren't positive how much landscaping we were gonna add. And I hope you saw from the photos that parking lot is just a wreck, as is the building. I mean, we're, really rehabbing two sites to fit up. Yep. Okay, thank you. Any uh, additional questions from the board? 
Okay, we'll take this under consideration. Um, thank you everyone for your hard work on this and in general, it's a sounds like a very important organization. So um, thank you for that. And we'll circle back with a response here. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks thank everyone. You. Have a wonderful weekend and happy Juneteenth. You, you too. Happy Juneteenth. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, we're going to move right along um, to calendar numbers 247-21-S and 248-21-Z. As counselors getting situated, I'm going to read the recommendation. So for calendar number 247-21-S, the Department of Planning and Development recommends denial of the proposed established <clears throat> is of, of the proposal to establish residential use below the second floor to convert an existing office space to an additional dwelling unit at the subject site. The subject site is located just south of the established Ashland Belmont Lincoln commercial intersection and is within a designated pedestrian retail street per section 7-3-0503-D. The introduction of ground floor residential is inconsistent with the char character of this area, which includes predominantly ground floor commercial uses, and it conflicts with intent of the pedestrian retail street designation, which is to, quote, preserve and enhance the character of streets and intersections that are widely recognized as Chicago's best examples of pedestrian-oriented shopping districts. Based on the foregoing, it is the department's opinion that the proposal to establish ground floor residential at the subject site is not compatible with the character of the surrounding area, is not in the interest of the public convenience, and will have a significant adverse impact on this commercial corridor and is contrary to the intent and purposes of zoning ordinance, particularly pedestrian retail street provision. Okay, counselor, let me know when you're on. Okay, this is Nick Fatikas, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. All right, All right great. And I, uh, I'll name my witnesses shortly. But if I can provide a brief introduction, um, again, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Nick Fatikas from the Law Offices of Sam Banks. Uh, we have offices at two twenty one North LaSalle Street. I'm here on behalf of the applicant Barrett Properties LLC. The applicant now owns the subject property located at thirty one thirteen North Lincoln Avenue. Uh, as you can see from the survey and even the uh, zoning map that's on the screen, the uh, subject zoning lot is uniquely shaped and contains two street frontages. The primary street frontage is along North Avenue, I'm sorry, is along North Lincoln Avenue, where the lot measures 24 feet wide. And the secondary street frontage is along Greenview, where the lot widens to 48 feet. The subject lot is located uh, just north of the intersection at Lincoln Avenue, which again runs at an angle and North Greenview. Um, so there's no alley access. And I believe the view you're looking at, uh, that building has been taken down. And that's the view again from North Greenview Street. The uh, subject property had been improved with a vacant one-story commercial building that extended to both property lines. The applicant has since taken down that building and again, begun construction on a new four-story mixed-use building. As a matter of background, variations were obtained by this same applicant back in September of 2020 to permit the current building design and unit configuration. And again, construction is well underway, consistent with the prior approvals and valid building permits. The issue that brings us before the board today is that the applicant is seeking permission to convert the uh, building's 838 square foot ground floor retail unit to a residential unit. The resulting building would then contain a total of 10 residential units and it would be supported by five off-stream parking spaces. This is a transit served location, so the proposed parking ratio is compliant with the zoning code. A special use is required though to permit the residential conversion because the subject property is located in a B1-3 zoning district. Provided the special use is approved and the, cha the change in use triggers a uh, technical variation to reestablish the building's rear setback. I want to be clear on that point because the variation um, is again technical in nature and would reestablish an existing and already permitted uh, rear setback condition again at 0.33 feet from the lot's rear property line uh, along Greenview Avenue. 
I have three witnesses available to testify today on behalf of the applicant, Mr. Michael Barrett, our project architect, Mr. Christopher Boehm, and our MAI designated appraiser, Mr. Terrence O'Brien. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, if you want to maybe swear the witnesses and then I can call my first witness. Yep, and uh, I see that uh, Mr. Boehm needs to be promoted, his hand is up. Um, and also, I want to see if Paul Sajovec is on from the Alderman's office because um, we have um, him, him noted as an objector here. So, come if we see Paul Sajovic, just promote him. I, I'm not sure I see him. I don't see him, uh, Chairman. Okay. Um, okay, then we'll, we'll see. We'll see if he pops on. Let's get um, the applicant sworn in. Nick, does it work for you if I just go down the line? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, Mike Barrett, can you state your name and address, please? Uh, Michael Barrett, uh, 3111 North Lincoln, Chicago, Illinois, 60657. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, if we've got Frank Lovato, can you state your name and address? Um, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Christopher Baum. I'm the, uh, the witness for 360 Design. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, Chris, can you state your name and address, please? Yeah, Christopher Baum, 2453 South Archer Avenue, Chicago. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Perfect. And then... Um, let me make sure we've got Terrence O'Brien on. Yep, I see him, and he is already sworn in and acknowledged for his expertise. Thank you. Yep. Do, you do you want me to call my first witness? Yep. Um, yeah, Counselor, go right ahead. I don't see anyone. We've got noted the alderman's office in objection, but I don't see anyone on. So. Okay. Well, uh, with that, Mike, can you please uh, restate your name and address for the record? Yes, it's uh, Mike Barrett, 3111, Chicago, 657. And you're the managing member of the applicant, Barrett Properties, LLC, is that right? Yes. That entity owns a subject property located again at 3113 North Lincoln Avenue? Yes. And as I described it in my introduction, the 4,191 square foot site is uniquely situated between North Lincoln Avenue and North Greenview. Is that right? Yes. And you're in the process of developing the property with a new four-story mixed-use building, correct? Correct. Again, as I stated, the uh, current building program is underway and consistent with the variations that were approved by the board back in September of last year. Is that right? That's right. And then for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm referring to ZBA call numbers 320Z and 30120Z, copies of both resolutions were included in our findings of facts submittal, and I'm simply incorporating them into the record. Yep. Uh, Mike, given the uh, continued trend of retail vacancy in the subject area, you're now seeking permission to convert what would be an 838 square foot retail unit into a residential unit. Is that right? Yes. And provided the special use is approved, you're also seeking a rear setback reduction to again reestablish the building's rear wall along uh, North Greenview, is that right? Yes. And that's an issue in this case uh, with respect to the setback uh, because of the subject's lots, atypical size and shape, and as we stated, a lack of alley access, correct? That's correct. And again, it's a technical request because it's already an existing setback condition and provided the special use and variation are approved, it actually wouldn't change the rear of the building, correct? Yes. Mike, do you believe you're generally familiar with the makeup and character of this stretch of Lincoln Avenue? Yes, our office is right next door to this site. And over the last few years, you've become plainly aware of the struggling retail market in that immediate area. Is that right? Yeah, we've, we've had a few other developments in the area. Um, so I, I'm very familiar with that area. Yes. And, uh, in terms of other developments, it actually includes the subject property, which uh, for a period of four years prior to your purchase, that one-story commercial building had been vacant as well. Is that right? That's right. On top of that, as part of this process, you and Mr. O'Brien identified 36 
retail vacancies along North Lincoln Avenue between Addison to the north and Diversity Avenue to the south. Is that right? Yes. Given these conditions, both you and frankly your lender are concerned about the viability of introducing new construction retail space into the marketplace. Is that right? That's right. And while these conditions began to take shape over a course of years, they've obviously only been compounded by the pandemic and its impact on local businesses, not only in this immediate area, but throughout the city. Right? Correct. So instead of introducing what would be presumably a 37th vacant retail storefront along North Avenue, I'm sorry, along North Lincoln Avenue, you're hoping to provide an occupied residential unit at the subject property, right? Yes. Mike, is it your understanding that my office filed witness statements on your behalf in this case? Yes. Mike, if you were to continue to testify, would your testimony be consistent with the statements we provided? Yes, it would. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to call Mr. Uh, Chris Boehm as our uh, second witness. Yep, go right ahead. And I'm just going to note, and Nick, I know you know the drill, but um, the objector is on, so we'll do we'll we'll we'll, we'll go um, to them after we get original questions out for you all, and then we'll circle back to you. Sounds good. Okay, uh, Chris, can you please restate your name and address for the record? Oh, Chris, you're on mute. Yeah, hi, uh, Christopher Baum, 2453 South Archer Avenue, Chicago. And Chris, you're a licensed architect in the state of Illinois? Yes, I am. You've testified in that capacity many times before this board, is that right? That's right. In fact, you testified as the architect of record back in um, 2020, September of 2020, for the variation applications that allow the, the current building to be constructed, is that right? That's right. And again, in this case, the requested variation would technically reestablish the existing 0.33 foot rear setback um, at the rear of the lot today. Yes. The only change would be the interior conversion of the 838 square foot retail unit to residential. Yes. Chris, is it still your professional opinion that the atypical lot size and shape together with the lack of alley access create the particular hardships or particular difficulties necessitating the requested variation in this case? Yes. And you still believe in your professional opinion that the variation, if approved, again, along with the resulting multi-unit residential building, will remain consistent and compatible with the other mixed use and multi-unit residential buildings in the immediate area. Is that right? That's right. And Chris, have you also reviewed the standards for building or development along a designated retail pedestrian street? Uh, yes, I have your opinion that the building design proposed complies with those general criteria? Yes. More specifically, the multi-unit building will continue to abut the sidewalk along Lincoln Avenue. Is that right? Yes. yes. The entrance to the building, which again already complies, will not be changed or altered to accommodate the residential unit on the building's first floor. Is that right? Uh, correct. It will remain the same. And there are no other deviations or changes that would, um, again, deviate from the pedestrian street building guidelines. Is that right? That's right. And Chris, with respect to the uh, variation standards, is it your professional opinion that the granting of this variation will not be detrimental to the public welfare or injurious to other property or improvement in the area? Uh, it will not be detrimental. Uh, it's an existing building condition. Uh, and will the variation, in your opinion, impair an adequate supply of light and air to adjacent property? No, it will not. In your opinion, will the variation increase the danger of fire or endanger public safety? No. Chris, will the variation substantially increase congestion in the public streets in the area? Uh, no, the building will continue to be supported by um, five off-street parking spaces consistent with the uh, transit-oriented development standards. And we're still maintaining a 50% parking ratio, unit to, yeah. unit yes. to parking ratio, correct? Y yes, we are. And lastly, is it your professional opinion that the variation will not alter the essential character of the locality? Uh, no, it will not. Again, the, the rear setback exists today. Chris, is it your understanding that my office filed a witness statement on your behalf in this case? 
Uh, yes, you did. And if you were to continue to testify, would that testimony be consistent with the statements we provided? Yes, it would be. Thank you very much. And then Mr. Chairman, my final witness is Mr. Terry O'Brien. Terry, can you please state your name and address for the record? Yes, Terrence O'Brien, O apostrophe B, R I E N, maintained offices at 7383 North Lincoln Avenue, Lincolnwood, Illinois, professional real estate appraiser, licensed by the state of Illinois, had the professional designation MAI. And Terry, you've uh, testified in that capacity many times before this board, is that right? Yes, sir. You're familiar with the subject property at 3113 North Lincoln Avenue? Yes, I am. The scope of your assignment in this case was to evaluate whether the requested special use would comply with the general criteria for special uses as set forth in the code. Is that right? That is correct. You also offered a general opinion as to whether the requested variation would also comply with the criteria for variation approval. Is that right? That is correct. Yes, sir. Part of your evaluation was to physically inspect the subject property. Is that right? Yes, sir as well as other property improve and improvements in the immediate area, correct? That is correct, yes, sir. And Terry, you've done that? Yes, I inspected the property in January 2021, and then again, just two days ago, Wednesday, which would be six, uh, June 16, 2021. And I've also done other work in the surrounding area, so I'm quite familiar with the property. The only uh, observation I would make is when I looked at the property in January, it was primarily vacant land, where now construction has started for a four-story structure, which is partially finished. Terry, getting back to the just the general area, can you uh, briefly describe the character of the immediate area for the board members? Yes, the area along uh, Lincoln Avenue, which is the subject fronts on, is mixed use with some residential, some commercial, retail, some office buildings, the age of these structures vary anywhere from relatively new to probably well in excess of 70 or 80 years. The areas to the east and west of Lincoln Avenue are primarily residential in nature. Um, the structures in terms of height, anywhere from two stories to approximately four or five stories is the primary height for all these buildings in the subject area. And Terry, in your inspection of the surrounding area, did you make a determination or a conclusion as to whether the addition of one ground floor retail unit would be appropriate and compatible at the subject site? I did, yes, sir. And what is that opinion, Terry? In my opinion, there's no need, demand for additional retail slash commercial space in the subject area. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, inspect the surrounding area, more specifically an eight uh, block strip from approximately uh, Matt Addison to Diversity Avenue. In that strip, when I did it in January, there was approximately 25 retail stores that were vacant. Subsequent to that, two days ago, I went back out to the subject site and surrounding area to again, familiarize myself with any changes that may have occurred. And then I discovered 11 additional vacancies of retail in that eight block strip. So that amounts to roughly a 44% increase in retail vacancies in that strip, again, from Addison down to Diversity. Also in the subject area, I would point out there are other residential uses on the ground floor along Lincoln Avenue. How many of those did you identify, Terry? Uh, are you talking now about the residential? The re the, correct, the residential at grade. Yes, um, the residential at grade, I'm uh, familiar with at least seven units. Uh, when I say seven units, seven structures. In some cases, some of these, there's more than seven units because there's one uh, particular development that's a townhome. So you're talking about just seven units in that specific development. So you could count them as seven units on top of the ones I just tried to say when there was sevens before. Therefore, you'd have substantially more than seven units. Also, there were several uh, residential uses, some of them which were uh, granted through special use for ground floor residential at the intersection of Lincoln, Berry, and Greenview. And the properties were zone B13, similar to the subject. And they, there were several special uses granted there for residential use on the ground floor. 
Gary, again, when we're talking about these figures, I want to be clear. In January, when you produced the original report, you identified 25 retail or commercial vacancy, vacant storefronts in that search range. Is that right? Yes, within Addison and Diversity, correct, along Lincoln Avenue. When you went back out to the property, you found 11 additional vacant retail storefronts. Is that right? That is correct. So the trend is, again, about a 44% increase in retail vacancy, correct? Yes, it went from 25 to uh, 36 units of retail of vacant, 44% now, increase. And by comparison, the ground floor residential units you located in that same search range, were any of those units vacant? No, to the best of my knowledge, they all appear to be uh, fully occupied. Okay. And again, this is based on multiple inspections over the course of a, approximately a six month period, correct? That is correct, yes, sir. So is it fair to conclude, Terry, that while the retail market and the retail units continue to struggle, the ground floor residential units have actually remained occupied and in demand in this particular part of the city. That is correct. The residents is certainly, is, there is a need and demand and there is not a need and demand for uh, commercial retail spaces. There's more than enough available. And again, uh, um, Terry, is, it's true that you prepared a written zoning uh, report containing your findings and, and ident identifying each of these uh, individual properties, and obviously your conclusions as they relate to the special use and variation findings. Is that right? That is correct. And a copy of that report has been submitted uh, to the board to the best of your knowledge, correct? Yes. For the record, though, is it your professional opinion that the requested variation will not substantially diminish or impair property values in the area? No, in my opinion, it would be just the, op just the opposite um, I believe that the utilization of the ground floor for residential purposes would uh, actually be a benefit to the area, provide for more residents, which may be able to support these uh, retail stores that are vacant. The more residents in the area, the more likelihood you're going to have a more support for these vacant stores. And, and again, with respect specifically to the variation, because the building wouldn't change, is it, fair to, is it fair to conclude that you don't believe there'd be, again, a negative impact created by the variation? No, I don't be any, no, no negative impact, no. Now, uh, with respect to the special use standards, again, is it your professional opinion that the requested special use will comply with all applicable criteria uh, of the ordinance? Yes, I believe it will. Specifically, the special use is in the interest of public convenience and will not have a significant adverse impact on the general welfare of the neighborhood. Oh, it will have no adverse impact at all. As I stated earlier, I think it'd be a positive impact. And again, taking that a step further, the idea here is instead of compounding the issue as it exists today and adding potentially a 37th vacant retail storefront along a pedestrian retail street, the idea is to provide a fully active an occupied building to help support the surrounding area. Is that right? That is correct. And I, I just one other point I should uh, bring up, and that's the fact that the structure that formerly existed on the subject site uh, had some retail space on the ground floor and has been vacant for the last four years. I'd also point out there's a building right immediately to the north on Lincoln Avenue that has some commercial space available, and that's been available for 10 years. Um, Terry, in your professional opinion, again, is, do you believe the special use will be compatible with the area in terms of site planning, building scale, and project design? Yes, I do. And do you believe it'll be compatible in terms of operating characteristics, such as hours of operation, lighting, noise, and traffic generation? Yes, I don't see any significant noise. It's residential in nature. There's not going to be any lights to speak of that would spill off onto other properties and amount of traffic is generated is, is minimal. And again, it would operate like any other residential unit, either at grade or above, right? Yes, sir. And lastly, Terry, do you believe the proposed special use is, is designed to promote pedestrian safety and comfort? I do, yes. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, before I conclude, um, I, I would like to speak, I don't know if it's appropriate now or if you want me to, 
um, to wait until we hear from the alderman's office. But the uh, Department of Planning's letter identified some standards in the pedestrian street ordinance, and I wanted to make sure I was able to, to address those. Do you, is, it's not really a closing, it's more a response to uh, yeah, DPD's if, letter. If you did that succinctly, Nick, that would be I great. Will, I will I do my to, I want to get then to um, Paul and even Steeple and Viano. All right, I'll, I will I will do it as, as efficiently as I can, Chairman. Again, great. the uh, Department of Planning's letter specifically refers to retail pedestrian streets, and those are codified at section 1730500 generally. And it's our understanding that both the department and we believe the alderman's office have at least in part some of their objection based on um, the designation of a retail pedestrian straight street for this segment of Lincoln Avenue. And while we're not challenging that designation in the slightest, we're asking the board to recognize the obvious changes in market conditions that have impacted the same stretch of Lincoln Avenue. Again, over the past few years, both before and now during the recovery from, from the pandemic. The introductory provisions of section 1730500 500 call for, quote, a high concentration of existing stores and restaurants, end quote, along the pedestrian street. The section goes on to describe a streetscape with, quote, very few vacant stores, end quote. As we sit here today, there are 36 retail vacancies along Lincoln Avenue between the, um, between Belmont, I'm sorry, between Addison and Diversity, 36. Per Mr. O'Brien's report and his testimony, that number includes, again, a wide range of units, some that are larger, some that are smaller. They're all sitting vacant. The addition of a new construction 838 square foot retail storefront into a struggling market does nothing to help promote or rebound the struggling retail street. To the contrary, as Mr. O'Brien testified, the addition of a fully occupied active building would actually help support the vacant retail storefronts as they start to come back to life. Uh, the other thing that I'd point out, um, again, this will conclude my, my response to the pedestrian street designation is section 17.3.0504H of the ordinance specifically prohibits certain uses from ever being established on lots of budding pedestrian streets. Those uses include strip centers, drive-through lanes, vehicle sales and services that require the, the outdoor storage of vehicles, um, gas stations, car washes, and residential warehouses. But a residential use below a building's second floor is not included in that general prohibition. The only conclusion we can make based on the text, based on the ordinance, is that City Council and the, ordin and the ordinance contemplated the establishment of ground floor residential uses being located along retail pedestrian streets, provided the special use criteria are met. And that's why we went through, item by item, the special use criteria uh, in this particular case. Great, thank you, Councillor. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, unless the board has any immediate questions, I wanna go to the objector and then circle back for questions, but, but are there any immediate questions from the board? Okay, let's go um, to the objector. So Paul Sajovic, um, if you're on, let us know and state your name and address. Uh, yes, Chairman. Uh, Paul Sajvik. Uh, I work at the 32nd Ward, 2657 North Clybourne Avenue, Chicago. Great. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? I do. Thanks, Paul. Okay, so if you could state um, state your objection here and hit on any topics as you see fit. Great. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Um, yeah, so we're objecting to this today uh, uh, because you know this lot is located on Lincoln Avenue amidst uh, pedestrian or oriented retail shopping district. Um, this block is one of several on this segment of Lincoln Avenue that is designated as such. Uh, and the blocks, the 2900, the 3000, the 3100 and the 3200 blocks of Lincoln Avenue are all entirely zoned to have retail or office uses uh, on the first floor. There are existing 
uh, you know, examples of uh, properties that, you know, don't meet that criteria. And there may be an exception here or there, but there's a clear uh, indication from the zoning up and down this entire segment of Lincoln that the city's desire is to uh, promote, you know, non-residential uses on, on the first floor. Um, the, uh, the existing B13 zoning is consistent with the predominant zoning on this block, which again does not allow for residential use on the first floor. The lot in question has 24 feet of frontage on Lincoln Avenue, which is typical for individual lots along this segment. And so we don't see any particularly particular um, difficulties or hardships that would preclude or prevent them from being able to have a first floor uh, retail space as um, you know, the, the zoning classification um, indicates. Uh, and we feel that the decision to allow residential uses on the first floor in this portion of Lincoln Avenue will not only disrupt the contiguous flow of retail spaces, but also detract from the overall appeal and financial potential of the existing retail spaces in this district. Uh, opening the potential for other property owners along Lincoln Avenue to pivot from first floor retail and office uses to residential will institute a measure of doubt concerning both the short and long-term trends for development along this segment. The Lakeview community where this site is located is known for being a vibrant area with a myriad of retail stores, restaurants, and various other attractions that draw people to shop, recreate, and live in this area. In light of the recent challenges posed by the pandemic, the city should be employing planning principles designed to help local businesses survive, recover, and thrive. And we feel a decision to allow first floor residential in this portion of Lincoln Avenue would prevent an unfortunate step in the opposite direction. So, you know, the, 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 the examples of vacant retail storefronts and so forth under the current conditions, there's no question that there are a lot of current vacancies. Uh, we, we would take a completely different uh, conclusion from that right now and say, you know, obviously there's a lot of vacancies right now. We're, we're just starting to emerge from, uh, you know, a, an unprecedented uh, pandemic that has decimated local businesses all throughout our neighborhoods and neighborhoods across the city. But the lesson to take from that is not that we should throw in the towel and give up on the idea that we're going to have vibrant uh, retail districts, but that we need to do everything we can to make sure that we're assisting and promoting uh, a healthy environment for them moving forward. There are numerous studies that show that pedestrians are more likely to walk where there are activated storefronts rather than blank walls or residential uses on the first floor. And we feel very strongly that first floor retail and office uses uh, are much better suited to um, promote density, uh, create walkable neighborhoods, encourage transit oriented development and reduce automobile trips. All things that we feel like are essential for the city of Chicago to continue to be uh, a vibrant, uh, attractive place for people to you know, live, work uh, and, and shop and recreate. And, and the idea that, um, that the that we would be in any way promoting a trend to sort of convert everything towards a, being a, an entirely bedroom community, I think is obvious step in the wrong direction and sort of the, the thing that we would see indicative of, you know, uh, creating a downward spiral, spiral where you're saying there's vacancies. So we're gonna, we're gonna allow more and more non-retail and office uses on the first floor, which then is gonna encourage more people to go in the same direction, which is going to continue to detract from the potential for these kinds of areas to be um, vibrant retail um, pedestrian districts. We do not feel in any way, shape or form that the pedestrian street designation requires first floor uh, retail use. It, it, it certainly doesn't, but it's also a very clear indication that that's what the city is hoping to promote in that area. And so for those reasons, we're, we're very strongly opposed to this um, uh, application today. And we hope that the development that was originally uh, uh, reviewed and approved by both our office, the neighborhood community organization, the chamber of commerce is you know, the one that we actually get rather than one that uh, institutes a first floor residential use amidst several blocks of, 
um, Lincoln Avenue that are that are designated, um, you know, for for uh, for for uses that are either retail or office on the first floor. So um, I, I'm happy to stay on and, and uh, respond to any questions. And uh, again, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to testify here today and all the work that you and the board have done to continue the city's important work throughout this uh, challenging time. Thank you, thank you. And before um, we go to see if Steve is on, um, I guess I wanna ask the general question of what, whether it was, there was a big difference of vacancies pre-COVID and if there's any, um, any steps, I mean, of course there's steps being done to get the retail business, but to start filling these vacancies because the numbers we heard from, um, from Terry were just a very large number of vacancies. So it's like the argument of we don't want empty space. Yeah, no, I mean, excellent. Those are excellent points. Nobody wants to see empty vacant uh, spaces um, anywhere, much less on, in a pedestrian oriented um, retail street like this. There's a, a, been a few headwinds for this area, you know, even pre pandemic, one is which the city's about 15 years behind on a streetscape improvement project that was um, designated for this segment of Lincoln Avenue, which was supposed to start once again this spring been delayed again uh, now because of a Department of Water Management water main replacement. But um, the the built environment, the you know amenities in terms of lighting and uh, um, sidewalks and so forth on these blocks of Lincoln has been um, allowed to deteriorate because the city has had this plan uh, on the books to do a, a very extensive streetscape improvement project. So to the extent that there are some uh, vacancies along this particular segment, uh, we feel very strongly that um, that has at least in part to do with the fact that um, the city has not been great stewards of the quality of the built environment and the public infrastructure on these blocks. And Alderman Waggis Peck has been pushing very hard to get this streetscape improvement off the ground, as has Alderman Tunney and Alderman Martin and his predecessor in the 47th Ward. And it's just been a series of stumbling blocks that have uh, delayed that significantly, but we are getting close to the finish line on that. And so we, we think that that will improve greatly. Um, the other point I would make is, you know, there have been headwinds even pre pandemic to brick and mortar retail from internet sales and so forth. Um, and there's no question about that. But I think the question that faces uh, a district like this and a neighborhood like this moving forward is, are we going to throw in the towel and say, we're going to go towards the direction of having everything be residential, or are we going to try to figure out creative ways to sort of repurpose some of these buildings and rethink how we do brick and mortar retail and make it more based on experiences and people being able to see products and more uh, restaurants and, and probably less, you know, stores where they're actually selling a lot of uh, merchandise on site. And um, those kinds of things take time. Any transition like this, it, it, like that is difficult. I, we believe that that was happening, um, you know, pre pandemic and obviously the pandemic, um, you know, uh, made all those conditions much more challenging uh, and I think it's way too early to be, you know, saying, well, we've got uh, a 44% increase in vacancy. I mean, the business community is just getting back on its feet. And um, uh, there, as, as any, uh, you know, economic study of these kind of conditions will show you, these uh, so sudden shocks take a long time uh, to, 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 for people to recover from. But we feel very strongly, given all the work that's been done by the Lakeview Chamber of Commerce and the neighbor, neighborhood community organizations in this area, that this segment of Lincoln Avenue is, is well positioned to be a healthy uh, retail oriented district moving forward. And we just think it's essential that everything that the city does is designed around assisting that effort and, and helping that effort rather than harming it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, before we before we turn to Steve, are there any questions from the board? I so had a, I had a question for uh, Mr. O'Brien uh, regarding the vacancies. Uh, I wrote down as you were speaking, uh, thirty six vacancies between uh, on Lincoln between Addison and Diversity. Did I did I get that right? 
That is correct. Uh, you said 30, 36? Is that that's what, what I wrote down, yeah. Okay, 36. yes, that's correct. Okay. That I counted. Uh, okay. Um, and it's kind of a it's a big stretch of uh, of of Lincoln. Are, are you able to tell us how many vacancies there are on the on us on the smaller stretch of like between Belmont and Wellington where this property sits? Well, yes, I could do that if you want to take a few minutes, and I'll go through each one of the. Uh, I've got a list here of all the vacancies with the addresses, so. If you wish to take the time, I'll be glad to read them off to you. We can decide how many are between Belmont and uh, what you I'd, were speaking of. I, uh, I'd, be interested to, I'd be interested to know how many vacancies there were between uh, Belmont and, and Wellington, as well as well, how what, many. What, how far north is Wellington without me looking it up? Do you know? Um, what, what hundred? Uh, 3,000. Uh, Wellington is 3,000. Okay. Wellington is three thousand. Okay. And I'd also Bel Belmont's thirty-two. Yeah. And I so, also oh sorry. Um, one other thing. Is that a question? Uh, yeah. One other question is just another in 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 line with that. I'd also be interested in knowing how many of the uh, 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 said there were seven structures that had residential between uh, Addison and Diversity. I'd I'd be interested in knowing how many residential at grade level is between uh, Belmont and Wellington. And again, Wellington just, <laughs> I want to get 3, this correct. Wellington is 3,000. Yeah. Okay, as far as commercial, between 32 and Wellington, I have, let's see, you want the addresses or what? I think the number would be fine. Okay, I got, I'm going to have to add them up because two, if, bear with me a moment. Sure. Three plus. One plus, one plus, two plus, one plus, one plus. Okay, I have between Belmont, you said, and Wellington, which is 300 north, and Belmont is 32. I come up with 11 stores, storefronts. And how much residential in that area? In that specific area, I'd have to look and see. In that particular area, there's no residential. Thank you. On the ground floor. Okay, Greg. Steve, are you Steve Valenziano? Are you on the line? I I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Can you state your name and address, please? Uh, Steve Valenziano, Assistant Zoning Administrator, Department of Planning and Development. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in today's proceedings? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Steve, so we're talking about 3113 North Lincoln and um, trying to just get additional background on the department's recommendation of denial for the special use. Yeah, so I was listening to everything that was said and, you know, uh, the department echoes uh, the alderman's office exactly what Paul had said. Um, you know, we, we look at this area, first of all, as a six corner intersection of Lincoln, Ashland, and Belmont. And we then look at it as a, a node. And the most important part of that node is that intersection. So one block in, in, in going out any spoke of that intersection, basically, is how we're looking at it. The pedestrian street designation, they were put in and they are continued to be put in uh, on uh, retail commercial corridors, re retail streets throughout the city. And they're kind of a plan for how we want to see the uh, development go in the future on these streets. While we do understand that there are uh, parking lots and there are curb cuts on many of the streets that we have designated uh, as pedestrian streets, the plan is as things 
as things change, as things come online, as things get constructed, they will follow the pedestrian street design guidelines. And as Nick read, those prohibited uses, those certain uses that we find are, are, are very uh, detrimental to the pedestrian uh, character and, and comfort of those streets are not allowed. But then the, as Nick said, ground floor residential is not prohibited, but it is a special use. And as we know, special uses have an impact on the area they're in uh, and need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And in this area, the department believes that because of this, you know, it's one block out, this is 3113, so one block south of Belmont. And so this is the node, the, the center of this uh, pedestrian six corner intersection and it is highly uh, transit served. I mean, it's served by uh, really the Brown Line, um, Red Line. Um, there's multiple bus lines here. Uh, Ashland Avenue is a transit served, uh, high capacity uh, bus line. Um, so there's many benefits for this property that could be taken rather than a single residential use on the ground floor, which kind of creates a dead space and a gap in this pedestrian street as you would as a pedestrian would walk along and want to shop or dine or go to a bar for entertainment or whatever. Um, this provides a dead, this, this creates a dead space. And the pro and another thing is based on the zoning of the property, it is a B1-3 and based on the fact that it is a transit serve location. So in, even with that B1-3, this property gets certain premiums because of its location and uh, proximity to transit that I don't see how this is the best, highest and best use for this property. Uh, and then I don't, if, I don't see how it is, you know, in, in um, the interest of the public convenience, if you're providing a, a dead spot on the street and you're not taking full advantage of, we're talking about adding density so that people will use uh, more of these retail um, and commercial uses along this pedestrian street, this property could support many dwelling units would get a would get a break in parking so that they could they wouldn't even have to provide the parking um, on site or at all. And they're not taking advantage of any of that, which all of that would lead to uh, a higher uh, foot traffic, higher use of retail uses in the area. And uh, again, provide a better pedestrian flow on the street if we don't have this gap uh, along uh, along Lincoln Avenue. And, you know, even if, even if we look at the 36 vacancies for a one mile stretch, that's really a two mile stretch because there's two sides of the street. And so that's a very low vacancy rate, I believe, for a mile of um, commercial uh, commercially zoned uh, properties. I mean, if we look at a 25 foot lot and you just do the math, it's about 11% vacancy for one mile or for really for two miles, because again, we look at both sides of Lincoln. So um, that's, that's where the department stands on this. We just think that the plan and the future of this area should be more, more residential density above grade and greater uh, usage of the retail spaces at grade um, and like, again, what Paul and the Alderman were saying, if there's other improvements the city can make and, and there's more creativity in how we use these ground floor spaces, you know, we think that there's, there is a bright future for, especially at this intersection, uh, which is an important intersection in this community. Okay, great. And I want to call, um, uh, cause Mr. O'Brien has his hands up. So, so Terry, go right ahead. Um, especially if this adds to the discussion with Steve. It not only adds the discussion with Steve, but also in my answer to Mr. Sanchez, I made a mistake. There was two lists that I had put together for the number of vacancies, and I didn't even look at the second list when I told you there was 11 vacancies in that two block area. So I went to the second list. Actually, there's 21 stores that are vacant from Belmont down to, I think you said Wellington. Was that correct? Yeah, that's right. I was asking about between Belmont and Wellington. Yes. So I, there's 21 vacant stores there in that two block radius. And then as far as uh, the need for all these uses that Mr. Valenziano spoke about, at this rate, there's, if you use a 25 by 100 foot space for each one of these uh, vacant spaces and 36 times 2,500, you're talking somewhere around 90,000 square feet 
that needs to be absorbed in this one area. In this area, as far as commercial retail goes, parking is really a necessity to really make it successful other than attracting people within the neighborhood where they can walk. And given the circumstances, the lack of parking in the, in the subject area, I just don't see where you're going to have a need for another five or 10 restaurants or whatever you want to put in there or bars and so on and so forth. And again, I would point out where the building that was on the subject site, there was four years vacant, the retail. The building next door was 10 years vacant. Those are just things I'd like to point out. Yep, thanks, Mr. O'Brien. Okay, any questions for um, first Mr. Yes, go, go ahead, sir. Um, I mean, based on what Mr. O'Brien just said, I'm curious, what did the applicant think they would use the space if it was four years vacant? What were their hopes for the space? <clears throat> Chairman, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner. Initially, when we came before the board in September, the idea was, you know, we were optimistic that things were correcting, that things were rebounding. Again, as uh, Mr. Vera testified to, he's actually one of the commercial tenants in a neighboring building that they own. Um, but the, the difference between September of 2020 and today is that 44% increase in retail vacancy. And the, the market has continued to struggle. And the fact is we have a smaller retail footprint we're at 838 square feet. That was actually part of the uh, zoning board approval back in September. And given these conditions and the 36 neighboring or however we wanna, whether it's within a mile or two, depending on the, the uh, calculation, the 36 retail vacancies and, and most importantly, the 90,000 square feet of vacant commercial space makes the viability of this as a retail unit extremely uncertain. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the board um, in general, I would say, but especially for Steve or Paul while we have them on? Okay, um, then let's, let's just to keep with process, circle back to um, the applicant. Um, for either any type of short closing or additional questions from the board. Chairman, if I could just very, I'll do my best to briefly, I have about four or five points I'd like to make on rebuttal based on the objector statements. Yep. And then absolutely we'll answer questions and I will try and keep it short and uh, sweet in terms of a closing. Uh, but first off, um, Mr. Sajovic referenced the whether or not there was a hardship for establishing a residential unit or not and a hardship is not part of the special use standard. So I wanna make sure that we don't confuse the standards for variation and the standards for special use. Hardship is not a standard that needs any type of consideration for a special use. Um, with respect to inconsistency, um, there are hundreds if not thousands of mixed use buildings that abut multi-unit residential buildings throughout the city. The city is a patchwork of such buildings. And as quoting Mr. Paul Wozniki, it's a harmonious, um, a harmonious situation where these buildings work off of one another. I, I don't believe that the proposed all residential building or more specifically a ground floor residential unit is somehow inconsistent in this particular case, given the makeup of the immediate area. Um, with respect to the streetscape improvements and some of the other long-term visions and plans, uh, yeah, that's, that's gr it's great to hear, but at the very same time, those are 15 years in the making. And given the current state of city finances and affairs, it's impossible for any retailer, let alone the applicant, to rely on those improvements to help bolster the commercial uh, market in the immediate area. And one of the other things, uh, I'm sorry, two more quick points, Chairman. Um, there was a, a question asked about the, whether or not there were other retail uses, I'm sorry, residential, ground floor residential units within the two block radius. Um, just because there isn't a, an existing similar use doesn't make it inconsistent. In fact, and without going on a complete tangent, 
the zoning code requires in some cases separation between uses. For example, a pawn shop has to be separated by a 1500 feet from another pawn shop. So using the logic that because there isn't one like it with in close proximity, it can never meet the special use standard. Frankly, it, it, that, that logic should fail. Lastly, we put a lot of emphasis on this one 838 square foot unit. It's very, it's in many respects, being treated as the linchpin to the commercial corridor. The board does not create precedent. The domino does not fall. What we're asking the board to do is recognize an extremely significant um, market condition, a, a 36 re retail vacancies, 90,000 square feet of combined retail space. And we're asking the board not to add 838 more square feet and a 37th vacant storefront. We believe a 37th vacant storefront does more damage to the pedestrian retail corridor than an active building to help support our neighboring residential units. Thank you very much, Chairman. Okay, great. Any other, any final questions from the board? Okay, sounds like none. Thanks everyone. We've got a bunch of information on this, so we'll take it under consideration. I was hoping on getting through um, next couple, but we'll come back um, with a vengeance and move, move things along a little bit at a pace. So I'm gonna call for a 30 minute lunch break recess so that everyone um, can uh, regroup a little bit. So. Um, this will go until 1.40 p.m. Central Standard Time. Commissioner Toya seconds. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Esposito? Yes. Commissioner Toya? Yes. Great. We're going to reconvene again at 1.40 p.m. for the remainder of the meeting. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>